Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. Tonight, we will be providing our live commentary to the Ogo testimony, testimony, pardon me, earlier today. Um, we haven't seen this one yet. Uh, it's with O'Gorman and... So it's uh, former president, CBSA of John Osowski, and uh, um, current president, Aaron O'Gorman. And Thank as you. usual, Fox and I are going to be going into this blind. Which is why I'm having so much trouble right now. There you go. <laughs> so Fox just got finished uh, helping uh, take care of some things right before uh, our son was going to bed. So there it is. As tonight is one of our special committee live streams. We're going to expect the live stream to be at least three and a half to four hours, just like last night. Um, and as usual, we do regret that we will not be able to respond to comments or questions in the chat, but Barnaby is in the chat, so please say hi to Barnaby. We will pause the stream periodically to respond to Super Chats, gifted memberships, and of course, um, give our take on the testimony itself. Um, before we get into that, just want to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, Don Wickenden with a five uh, gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very, very much. The gifts are already started, everybody. So please give uh, Donna thanks. And it also looks like we had a couple of other things that occurred. Jerry Savoy upgraded his membership from NP Supporter to MP Supporter Plus. Thank you very much, Jerry. And uh, if I'm correct, uh, shortly before that, you also gifted five Northern Perspective memberships. So... Um, that is wonderful that we start off the chat like this. So um, here we go, everybody. Uh, this occurred earlier today. It lasted from around one o'clock to about 3.40 from what we understand. Um, from the limited information we heard, it will be something to remember. Uh, take, that, take that from that what you will. So here we go. Order. Welcome to meeting number 98 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates, also known as the Mighty Ogo, the only committee that matters. Pursuant to Standing Order 1082 and the motion adopted by the committee on Monday, October 17, 2022, committee is meeting on the study of the RiveCan application. Just a reminder to those in uh, person not to put your earpieces next to the microphone as it causes feedback and potential injury to our very valued interpreters. Uh, we have two witnesses today. Uh, welcome back, Ms. O'Gorman and Mr. Osowski. I understand you both have opening statements. So we'll start with you, uh, Ms. O'Gorman, for five minutes, please. Good afternoon, bonjour. Quand j'ai témoigné devant le comité en octobre, the committee in October, I talked about the internal investigation that I initiated following receipts of allegations of misconduct and the referral made to the RCMP. Le 19 décembre, back from the internal CBSA investigation. A preliminary statement of fact is not a conclusion and does not reflect all of the information, including from respondents. It's relevant documentary evidence collected to date in the course of an investigation. As laid out in my correspondence to you, these packages contained documents that fit the parameters of material that you requested in October. As such, it was translated and provided to you. The emails that you were provided are also relevant to testimony you received at previous meetings. Specifically, it shows that the Botler chatbot was not the result of an unsolicited proposal and that there was a pattern of persistent collaboration between certain officials and GC strategies. They show efforts to circumvent or ignore established processes and roles and responsibilities. I need to say at this point that the investigation remains ongoing. Ideally, it will be further informed by information and interviews from key individuals who have been requested to speak to the investigators. Okay, so a couple things off the hop. Um, if you didn't see it, which if you were not on X, you probably didn't see it. Um, we released a small little video 
And what this was related to is something that happened at the very, very end of the committee video, which we actually didn't get to. Yeah, we cut it off a little bit early, I guess, um, because we figured, oh, it's just committee business. You nothing know, like, unusual. Nothing ever happens. Right. right? <laughs> nothing unusual ever happens in but committee, of course. except the one that we cut off. Exactly. So what happened was right as they were about to wrap up and shut down committee, Liberal MP Charles Souza, everyone's favorite um, gangster impersonator, asked a very peculiar question. He said to the chair, who's conservative, Kelly McCauley, um, just want to confirm, uh, chair, if we will be having the committee meeting tomorrow in camera as requested by the president of the CBSA. And when we learned of that, we were pretty taken aback we said hold up what why why would you ask for this to be in camera now um it's it's kind of strange the way government terms things in camera means away from the cameras yeah <laughs> like that's that's what it means it means that it's not recorded it's not streamed it would not be available on parview or any other streaming service they don't even put the transcript up like nothing right <laughs> so it was very strange that um, you had the liberals saying, so this is going to be in camera, right? And Mr. McCauley's response to that was, no, it will be public. And that was the end of that. The other thing that happened is Garnet Genuous had raised a question to the chair about when Mr. Firth would be coming back. And Mr. McCauley revealed that a second summons had gone out to Christian Firth and um, Darren Anthony, the founders of GC Strategies, to which they responded with the exact same response that they were refusing the summons due to their mental health. That seemed to cause a bit of a stir with the conservatives, and it was suggested that they're going to talk about what they're going to do with that response, um, possibly today, so maybe that's at the end of committee, or they were going to wait until the 29th of January to, to decide what to do with that. So that kind of happened early. Now let's get to some of the things that Erin O'Gorman said. Um, she said that they had provided some an, an initial findings report to the committee and it's our understanding that she also provided this initial findings report to the superiors of both Antonio Utano and Cameron McDonald, their current superiors. So that seems to have led to their dismissal. And what she's saying right now is actually corroborating what Botler has been saying all along, which is that they found evidence that this was not an unsolicited bid. Remember, Cameron McDonald and Antonio Utano were sitting in committee saying, we were just sitting here minding our own business, and all of a sudden, GC Strategies and Botler approached us saying, we have the solution for you. So the investigation by the CBSA, according to Aaron or uh, Gorman, is saying, no, no, we didn't find that. We found evidence of collusion between these two guys and maybe some others we don't know and gc strategies so that's corroborating what botler has been uh what B botler has been saying and what botler has proven with their evidence so interesting interesting angle that we're starting this off as and as i was saying all of that we did receive a couple of super chats, so thank you very much. Uh, XJAX CX uh, with a 699 super chat. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work you do. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, it uh, makes it easier to do the work we do when, when people are actually around to see it. So thank you very much. And Don Wickenden back with a $5 super chat. Thank you so much, Don. Popcorn, beer, single malt, and time to kill. This is going to be epic fun once again. Cheers. That sounds like a Yeah, that great... sounds really good. <laughs> I wish I could eat popcorn, but yeah. none of you would appreciate that the over crunching. the mic. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. I'm trying to balance my knowledge of information that you have been seeking against the integrity of the investigation. 
In other words, respect for both due process and for Parliament. Public servants, the employees of the CBSA, need to have confidence in our disciplinary processes and the internal investigations that support them. Parliamentarians should know if information that is provided to them is unsupported by facts. La conclusion de notre travail interne nous apportera à la clarté. Work will bring us the clarity that we need to take more exhaustive action in the future if necessary. As I testified at my previous appearance, I have already implemented changes in how the agency manages and oversees procurement. Better controls and oversight have been put in place, including having those with procurement authority in headquarters retake their training, having a senior committee review every task authorization and centralizing procurement responsibilities within the organization. These controls will be calibrated over time and with a fuller understanding of what happened and why. And the procurement ombuds. It will also be informed by the internal review that is ongoing with respect to contracts and documents associated with ArriveCAN. I would like you to assure you that my team is working full out to provide you as quickly as possible over 30,000 pages of information that you have requested from CBSA in the course of your study. Nous avons déjà fourni six lots de documents. We have provided CIS packages of translated records. Translation on the remaining material is ongoing. I will continue to send bilingual packages as they are completed. We know everything. What we do know is not okay. I'm concerned and I want to get to the bottom of it. I must emphasize how critical it is that the CBSA maintain the confidence of Canadians as we carry out our important mandate. The situation should in no way dishonor the dedicated employees, frontline border service officers across the country and around the world, serving Canadians day in, day out with professionalism and integrity. I'm focused on not letting that happen. I expect you'll have questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. O'Gorman. Mr. Osowski, welcome back. You have five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today. We are approaching four years since these events unfolded, so I'm relying on the best of my recollection, what the agency has provided me, as well as my review of the testimony from previous meetings. I would like to take this opportunity to clearly lay out the facts as I remember them. If the committee has other relevant information they wish to share with me, I hope you will do so, and I'll be happy to review it and get back to you. I'm going to begin with reminding the committee of the exceptional circumstances we found ourselves in during March of 2020. We were shutting down the largest unprotected border in the world while trying to ensure that critical supply chains remained functional for the essential trade of food, medicine, PPE, etc. We had repatriation flights for Canadians returning home and had to manage immigration issues with the United States. We had to manage fear and uncertainty in our own workforce while ensuring the integrity of our frontline operations. Coordinating this with our U.S. counterparts and supporting the government in this historic time was my priority. Arrive Can helped us administer the pandemic border measures, but I relied on my officials to deal with the procurement details. I will now turn to a few points made by Mr. McDonald during his testimony regarding Deloitte and the vendor selection. Mr. Uh, Sorry. Mr. Akari, you're not muted. Okay. I will now turn to a few points made by Mr. McDonald during his testimony regarding Deloitte and the vendor selection process. With respect to comments he made about the CARM contract with Deloitte, I have reviewed my business records and I offer the following context. On March 14th, I received an email from the senior partner at Deloitte offering to help in any way they could with our challenges during the pandemic. I immediately passed this along to several of my vice presidents. The vice president of the CARM project replied that while Deloitte had cleared people who knew our systems, they were already stretched on CARM. This is the best evidence of the true state of play with Deloitte clearly not a penalty box issue. And I will emphasize that all of my business records clearly show a cordial and business-like relationship with Deloitte. All I can say is that we are all working with Deloitte to make sure CARM was a success. With respect to Mr. McDonald's statement that VPs were told not to use Deloitte, I have no recollection of providing this direction. I have asked a few members of my former executive team if they recall this, and they don't. 
In fact, one of them said that they would have objected if I had said that, as Deloitte was working on other contracts within the agency at the time, and there were no issues. My okay, so um, I'll let that go on for a bit because there is you know, kind of some irrelevant uh, information being provided by both O'Gorman and Osowski. You know, they're trying to say, oh, you know, it was a busy time, blah, 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 blah. And O'Gorman is essentially trying to say, you know, I'm, I've been doing my utmost to um, to allow the CBSA to continue on in order to make improvements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are things that she's supposed to say. So that's fine. What's interesting here is Osowski just painted a picture of the fact that um, this is this is showing that Cameron McDonald is being pinned in a corner as to the fact that there was no issue with Deloitte, like Cameron McDonald said. Remember, McDonald said in his testimony that he was asked to put together some some proposals. So he worked all night on putting together a proposal for Deloitte and. Uh, Utano put together a proposal for GC Strategies, and they both walked into Mindone's office, and Mindone, Mindone allegedly said, well, Deloitte's in the penalty box, so that's out, so I guess we're going with GC Strategies. So that was the narrative that Cameron McDonald had laid out. And then, if you recall, Mindone had come back and said, that's not what, would ha that's not what happened. Um, I was this, I was brought two different directions. One was, do we use a complete third-party vendor? Or do we use a uh, kind of a hybrid approach where we use internal people and some external contractors? And that was the, the direction I provided. I didn't choose GC strategies. I just provided the direction which led to GC strategies. I didn't choose it. So this testimony by Asowski right now is, is pinning McDonald in a corner by saying, nobody said that. I don't recall anybody saying that. And... You you made this decision all on your own, and this aligns with what Butler has been saying, unless we've completely misunderstood it. But this makes sense. What confuses me is why didn't Osowski talk about this before? Why didn't O'Gorman talk about this before? Don't know. As as the critical drinker would say, don't know. My understanding is that Deloitte has continued to work with the agency. To be clear, a deputy minister has no authority to ban a firm unilaterally. No one was in the penalty box, and there's no evidence to support this. I'll now focus on the few days following the request from the Public Health Agency to look into an app that I received on March 22, 2020. I immediately forward this request to my CIO, Mr. Duan, as well as my vice president of the Travelers Branch. Four days later, on March 26, Mr. Duan shared simple mock-ups of what the application could look like with myself and my executive vice president. The committee will have seen two relevant meetings in my calendar at this time, one on March 26 at 10 a.m. where I had a teleconference with Mr. Duan and my executive vice president where he showed us the mock-ups. And at 10.43 a.m. that same day, I forwarded those simple mock-ups to the DM of Health and the president of the Public Health Agency. On March 27th, we had another meeting to discuss issues raised by those same DMs. To be clear at this point, no one could have envisioned how many versions and releases of the app would, there would be, nor its cost. Now, before we get any further, uh, I was remiss. I didn't actually get to the couple of super chats that came in, so I want to get to those. Dan Demand 966 with a $2 super chat. Best channel. Let's get the likes up. That's a great idea since we're about 400 likes behind, which is about half. Let's go, people. Let's get those likes up and break our record of 1,356 concurrent people on a stream. Um, a lady loves cats with a 279 super chat. Single malt ready here too to Cypher and Fox. To you, my lady. Thank you. I would love a single malt whiskey right now. <laughs> uh, and NT with a $10 super chat. Thank you, uh, Northern Perspective. Great show and beautiful people in chat. I completely agree. It's your first uh, first uh, super chat on the live stream. So congratulations on that. And thank you very much. And Jerry Savoy with a $2 super chat. Feel like broken record. Please hit the like. Yes, please. Please do. It pushes the stream out and suggests it to other people. And... For some reason, some people aren't getting the YouTube notifications, so existing subscribers and members, um, this is very helpful because it'll pop up in their uh, recommended uh, YouTube videos on their YouTube home screen. So please get those likes up so YouTube pushes it out. 
I have reviewed my business records during this time period, and I have not been able to find any emails from Mr. Duan or anyone else regarding vendor selections op options developed by Mr. McDonald or Mr. Utano. The agency has confirmed this to me as well. I have no recollection of being asked for my opinion on Deloitte or any other potential vendor as part of the arrive CAM procurement. Speed was of the essence, as airports were slowing down with the paper-based process and provinces were demanding better data. I was relying on my vice presidents for their best advice on how to manage this situation. That's normal, by the way. Um, you know, when you have a CIO uh, or any executive and you say, here's the project, go figure it out, and they come back to you and say, this is the direction we're going to go, uh, typically the response from the president is, is it going to work? How much is it going to cost? And when's it going to be done by? They typically won't be asking questions about vendor and who's doing it. Why? Because they don't have the expertise to do that. That's why they have a CIO or other executives, depending on what that project is. So that all completely makes sense. Well, I haven't seen any of the documents involved. Mr. Dewan's testimony states that he was provided a choice between a fully outsourced Deloitte solution or an option to augment our existing capabilities. Mr. Dwan testified that for a variety of reasons, such as using the CBSA cloud versus a private sector cloud, speed and agility, that the staff augmentation was the preferred approach. This choice makes sense to me, especially considering the legal and privacy issues involved. Given what I've stated, the choice appears to be a rational, business-based decision and nothing to do with CARM. If the committee has different information in their possession, then I'd be happy to review it. To this day, I remain exceptionally proud of how the CBSA responded to the pandemic, and I hope these current matters don't diminish the efforts of the many thousands of CBSA employees who served Canada during this unprecedented event. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Osowski. We'll uh, start with uh, Mrs. Cousy for six minutes, please. The floor is yours, Mrs. Cousy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Imagine this. You are a public servant. You are someone who has made the decision to come and help your country. I made this decision. I personally made this decision as a member of the Canadian Foreign Service. You swear. You swear that you will act in, in your best capacity possible for the best interest of this country. Now imagine that the the worst situation for your nation occurs since wartime, a pandemic, a pandemic, and you are forced to make the best decisions possible that you can in your position for your nation with the information that you have. You do your best. You navigate the system, but things go wrong. Things go wrong. The application that you are working on ends up in, to be a 54 million dollar boondoggle, a stain on the government, which is already neck deep in boondoggles, another instance of uh, possibly an ethical behavior by this government, and certainly incompetent behavior by this government, and a definite lack of oversight. But you tried your best because you were a public servant. The stress of the investigation of this 54 million boot million dollar boondoggle gets to you. So you go on medical leave and you think things can't possibly get worse, but they do get worse and they got worse for Cameron McDonald, who was a director general at CBSA and, uh, and Antonio Utano, who was an ADM at the Canada Border Services Agency. Things got worse for them after coming here, giving what they believed was truthful testimony, their heart felt testimony to speak truth to power, to speak truth to Canadians when they were suspended, but not only suspended, suspended without pay. And okay, I have to stop Stephanie there. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I said it yesterday when Genuis was talking that this spin they're trying to take that McDonald and Utano or these poor public servants who've been done wrong by, you know, big brother government. Um, it's disgusting, quite frankly. Um, yeah, so let me just lay this out for everybody. So Kusi's coming out of the gate with a lot of passion, but here's, here's, I, I have a problem with this. And if this is the stance the Conservatives are going to take, We've I'm going to have, have a big problem yeah. with it. So, and, and this is the thing, folks. We 
We promise to bring you the truth, the objective truth, based on everything we've seen up to date. Utano and McDonald are not whistleblowers. They're not victims. Like, this is really gross to me. That's why I'm at a loss for words. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of why we had, we addressed it yesterday um, because of some of the posts that, uh, that we'd seen. Um, Cameron McDonald is, is not someone that you should feel sympathy for. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Heartfelt testimony. What they felt was truthful testimony. That's what Kusi said. They may have thought it was true. That could be accurate. But the conservatives in that committee meeting, we can go back and watch it. it in that committee meeting, they were pissed at Utano and McDonald because they felt that they were being lied to. Well, they were because one of Cameron's quotes revolves around what Butler did. Cameron McDonald accused Butler of trying to swindle the government. If you recall, he said that they were just asked to do a feasibility study and they went out back and built a swimming pool and a garage and a new deck and all of this stuff. And he's saying, you know, it's not my fault. Whereas there's evidence, there's actual evidence of Cameron McDonald and Christian Firth communicating back and forth. That's what Butler has provided to committee. We've seen that. And it turns out, based on what Aaron O'Gorman and John Osowski were saying, they found the same thing in the CBSA investigation. So that actually corroborates what Butler already said. Here's my problem. What it seems like what they were saying yesterday and what Kuzi is opening with now is they're using this as a platform to attack cabinet. Now, that's fine if you want to do that. The problem is, is don't be making Cameron McDonald and Tony Utano into innocent people. They're not. Well, that's it. Don't make sinners into saints. Like, uh, I was trying to rack my brain all day today after last night's stream, and I was thinking, why why would they take this approach? Because it looks incredibly bad in the public when, what was it, three weeks ago they were going after these guys in committee, insinuating that they're lying to committee. I I can't recall if they had to summon them or if they came willingly, but but it was it was very aggressive like it felt aggressive and it it the whole committee meeting felt aggressive so why now are they turning around and being like oh these poor guys it looks bad to the public because these two guys finally face some accountability we suspect that something was found and that's why they were suspended and had their security clearances revoked and now the conservatives are trying to spin this yarn that oh it was done to punish them because they're whistleblowers I'm not buying it. I'm sorry. They were summoned to committee. Like the whistleblowers are Ratika Dutt and Amir Morv. Those are the whistleblowers. Now, here's the most important part about this whole thing, folks. Assuming Ratika and Amir have, have watched this, what must they be thinking? Because up to now, they have no doubt been collaborating with committee, providing evidence and hoping that people are going to get some accountability. They would have seen what happened to Cameron McDonald and Utano earlier this week and said, yes, finally. And now the conservatives are coming out and essentially coming across that they believe everything that Cameron and, Ut and, and Utano has said. And I don't care what their end goal is. This is the wrong way of doing it. Right. But, but if you carry that to completion, everybody, if they're coming out like they believe everything that Cameron McDonald and Tony Utano said, then they must believe that, that Butler tried to swindle the government. Which is completely false. You know, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm grossed out by the fact that, that the conservatives would be using the term whistleblowers for McDonald and Utano because they weren't whistleblowers. They came to committee. They fudged their way through the whole committee. Like, they didn't proactively come to committee. They were, they were called to committee. 
if they were whistleblowers, they would have risked life and limb to go to committee or to go to their MP or to go to somebody and get this shut down. They didn't. And I love to comment on, on one of uh, Stephanie's videos yesterday that she put out. And I said, sorry, Stephanie, these guys aren't innocent. The ministers aren't innocent, but these guys aren't either. And I got to say, this is very disappointing that they're taking this approach because like, I don't want to speak too early, but if they continue on this, on this path, what they are telling people is they're less interested in justice and they're more interested in getting at the liberals. Right. And it seems to me that's what's happening. Like, I mean, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but it seems like, okay, we've got what, two, a week and a half, let's say, until the House of Commons resumes. There's no committee next week because the House isn't in session. The 29th, everything comes back. And then it's, what, five weeks after that until we predict that they're going to call an election. So are they trying to, like, get one last scandal in that they can directly tie to the Liberals right before an election? But this is the wrong way to do it. Yeah, um, the end does not justify the means. At all. Because you're playing with people's lives here. So I'm hoping this changes. Uh, I saw one of the comments that it changes later on. I hope you're right. I, I really hope you're right. Um, otherwise, this may be the first massive mistake that the conservatives have made in over a year. But we're just starting. So let's see where it goes. Let's strap in. Everyone take your shots. <laughs> And for what reason? They claim that they were misled by senior CBSA officials. They were intimidated that this was retaliation, that this was an attempt to muzzle them, that this was uh, their the CBSA's opportunity to use them as a scapegoat. There were no allegations, no details, no evidence. What they did receive were threats, threats that decisions would be made if they were not compliant. So, Ms. O'Gorman, I'm here to ask you today, on behalf of Mr. McDonald, on behalf of Mr. Utano, on behalf of public servants everywhere, on behalf of Canadians, why were Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano suspended without pay? CBSA is conducting an internal investigation. Neither of those individuals work Ms. for the Gorman, CBSA right now. I believe anything that you say today, uh, uh, these canned speaking notes, when both Mr. McDonald and Ms. Rutano have stated that they were misled uh, by senior CBSA officials as to who even chose a rye can. This committee has found you not having spoken the truth before to this committee before. What, there's no reason we should release. Can you tell the committee then what evidence do you have of Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano for their suspension? Can you share with that, please? What evidence do you have for this committee? I'm not using speaking points, and I, and I don't believe I've been informed of not having told the truth to this committee. I did not take those actions. They don't work for me. Well. Now, okay. So one thing that... O'Gorman is correct on is she does not have the power to fire anybody. Not not either of those two. And you know why? Because Utano does not work for the CBSA. He works for the CRA. McDonald does not work for the CBR, CBSA right now. He works for Health Canada. Or he did. He did. So again, we're being we're we're just laying down the facts here. So Stephanie coming after Aaron saying, why were they fired? She can't speak to why they were fired. Now, the question that she can speak to is a reasonable one by Cousy when Cousy's saying, what evidence did you, you know, did you find about Cameron McDonald and Tony Utano in your investigation? That's a reasonable question. Because Aaron O'Gorman offered that we found, you know, that they did certain things in this investigation. Okay, so you need to provide that evidence to committee. This, this is going to be a tough one, folks, because I think O'Gorman's going to be squirming the whole time and and Koozie's going to be, you know, coming at her like a Mack truck. So And we're pretty riled up, too. So, so. Um, we're going to try and just navigate this as as as, as best we can. Um, so uh, before we get into that, Don Wicken with the $5 Super Chat, the compromises they make right now have, have uh, full consequences. Full stop. 100%. Yeah. Exactly. And um, 
again, if, if their goal is to get McDonald or Utano to talk by trying to like buddy buddy up to them, this is not the way to do it. No. No, because you're, you're ma- again, you're, you're making, making a deal with the devil. Saints out of sinners. Yeah. And it's, it's just showing the public that there's no consequences. Yeah. And, and that is not the thing this country needs right now. This country needs... This country needs to be shown that when you do something wrong... There's like, accountability. There is accountability and there are consequences that we don't let criminals roam the streets. Uh, Mr. Roscoe Peel with a $5 super chat. I'm thinking the Conservative Party doesn't want it uh, to land on uh, only two people as the Liberals NDP coalition trying to push this on all of them. And I, I don't disagree. Um, but we can only judge people by uh, on their actions, right? The, the actions right now are indicating that, you know, they're using McDonald and Utano as, as, a, as a martyr in order to, to go after elected officials. You, you know, go after elected officials if the evidence leads you there. You know, the other thought that I had today while I was kind of ruminating on last night's stream is that I wonder if McDonald went to them and said something like, um, I'll talk, but this is what I want. I want my name cleared. Yeah. I, is it possible? Perhaps. It's possible. It's, I, still, though, it, the ends doesn't justify the means to me. I think they're making a royal mess of this. So anyway, let's let's see. Let's see how this goes. We would like to know what what evidence you had. That was my question as well. Their legal fees were being paid until uh, this point of their suspension. And now they're no longer being paid. Why did you suspend paying their legal fees? Wrong question. Frickin wrong question, Stephanie. Come on. The question on the legal fees should be, why were they being paid in the first place? That's the question you should be asking. Well, especially if they didn't work for CBSA right. at the time. Like, excuse me, if you're under investigation for a crime, which is allegedly what they what they were, why is the government helping you? You should only be helped by federal counsel if your organization is under investigation. Yeah, so like you you do something wrong in the in, in the context like performing of the workplace. Of your duties. Yeah. In the context of the workplace. The question you should be asking is why were you paying for them in the first place? Awful question, Stephanie. Come on, get it together. So the preliminary statements of fact were provided to their deputy heads and I took decisions that were consistent, that are consistent with the Treasury Board policy on legal fees. Yeah, th- this information isn't providing any new information to us, uh, Ms. O'Gorman. Is this the type of treatment that CBSA whistleblowers can expect in the future? Oh Is this God. the type Stop of treatment that public servants can expect in the future? The CBSA was also made to know of threats against Mr. McDonald by Mr. Doan. What steps then can you tell us did you take to protect uh, Mr. McDonald from facing negative reprisals from from higher ups, please? I have a problem with this, too. Well, because... as far as I remember, they were never corroborated. Well, like there was no evidence to prove that there was threats. In committee, they actually rebutted that because they read the email from McDonald to Mindon. And Brock went after Cameron McDonald based on that email because it was quite obvious that Cameron McDonald was coaching Mendon how to speak in committee. Brock even accused him of witness tampering, which is illegal. Now you're coming and turning around and saying, oh, they were threatened? Yeah, something something is just off here. I don't know if this is a move by the conservatives or like I said, I suppose it's possible that McDonald or McDonald's attorney went to them and said, Hey, if you want this information that I have, then you have to work with us. And this is what I want. I have no idea, but again, this is the wrong way to do it. And here's the thing, folks, like I, like I know we're actually going after Kusi and the conservatives right now, but um, you know, 
it's 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 the one thing we've promised all of you is it doesn't matter the party it's the platform well yeah when we see garbage we're gonna call it out yeah and uh um we're we're really disappointed and you know for for all of you who've been really rooting for the conservatives um i imagine you're just as disappointed as we are but y you have to call a spade a spade um this is how how they're held to account is there some master plan here Maybe be. because like up to now, the conservatives have been operating flawlessly. Like this something is a huge, has changed. Yeah, this is a huge misstep if you ask me. But like something caused it. Th th that's the problem. We don't know what it is. Um. Anyway. I want to say thank you to Listless Receptionist with a $2 super chat. It says, I feel like I need a hug right now. Uh, we, I think we all need hugs right now. Um. This is extremely disappointing to watch. It's it's. It's disgusting. It's abhorrent. Like, I cannot believe that this is the approach the conservatives are taking. It seems short-sighted at best and, I don't know, malicious, stupid at worst. I don't know. It's bad. Not going to lie. Pretty happy I removed my application to be an MP right now. Maybe that'll change. I don't know. But uh, Yeah, because you might be the one asking these stupid questions. Quite comfortable in my chair holding these guys to account. I had that testimony here. There are processes and systems in place when somebody believes they've been subject to harassment. I'm trying to conclude an investigation. My interest is understanding what happened. You I have don't an understand. To speak the truth to people here today. Just tell us, tell Canadians, why were they suspended without pay? Share that with everyone. She can't answer that question, Kusi. They're not her employees. It sounds silly you asking that again. O'Gorman's answer is going to be, unfortunately, a reasonable one. It's going to be, they don't report to me. I can't answer you that. What she should be saying, what she should be narrowing in on is what evidence were you, you know, was provided that, that, that you found in your investigation. That's what she should be saying. So, um, anyway. Uh, Junior Soul says, hold on, Cypher, it will turn around. I certainly hope so, because <laughs> uh, I'm going to be an alcoholic by the end of the night if this keeps up. Uh, <laughs> Nilik with a $2 super chat. Could she be acting on her own? I don't think so, no. based on the post that we saw yesterday. Yeah, I, I honestly feel, especially because it started yesterday, I think Genuous is the ringleader on this one. Um, call it a gut feeling, but he seemed to be going pretty hard like as we were closing committee yesterday. Um, and now there's this today, so, so we'll um, see. yeah. Um, Rock Monkey with a six nine nine super chat. I don't fully agree. We don't have all the info or know how deep this goes. Things aren't as they seem, and I don't think the PCs would screw this up. Uh, I don't disagree, Rock. That's why this is so it's, strange. Yeah, it's, a, it's upsetting. It's, a, it's weird. It's I don't like it. <laughs> well, it's a drastic change in direction, and so like there must be a reason for that type of change. I'm just I'm hoping we're gonna get to it. Um, the dude with a $2 super chat. Maybe there is a method to her madness. As I said, I, I hope so. Jerry Savoy with a $5 super chat. Wondering if the RCMB, RCMP uh, has something to do uh, with Stephanie. Could be. And Don Wickenden with a $5 super chat. Does anyone else but me think that this is not a planned thing? The cons are too high on the polls. Uh, this feels planned. Well, yeah, because... It definitely Every, feels scripted. Everything that they've done is is very calculated, right? And I don't believe in Stephanie's um, outrage completely here. It seems manufactured. Like it's well, seems yeah, fake. like she came out of the gate. It's like she, it's like someone ran over her cat and she walked into committee. It, it's just, it's strange. Um, so, anyhow. People are saying that this is going to get better, so we'll see. Uh, I think we may have missed this super chat from Rob Burkhouse. It's a $5 super chat. Thank you. It says, this is why I love your channel. Hold everyone to account. That's right. You know, we, we do favor the conservatives for this election um, because their policies align with our values um, and what we believe in. But that doesn't mean they don't do stupid stuff every now and then. And, and this, to me, feels... Like I said, stupid or malicious or this is just the wrong approach. Okay, so so Kim Court says just wait. All right, I'll 
I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll bottom angler up and, and we'll let it out later. If uh, Dan to man 966 for the $5 super chat. I'm with you, Fox. I can't connect the dots to this and I'm stunned just like you guys. Well, um, allegedly this is all part of the plan, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. I did not take that action and it's not for me to talk about. Exactly. Their deputy heads took that asking. action. There are accusations that the public safety minister at the time was wanting someone's head on a plate. How involved was that current minister in the building of Arrive Can? And how involved was that minister's office in covering up the misconduct connected to the development of the Arrive Can app? That's a reasonable question. Comments occurred after I retired. I can Again, speak. I can speak okay, to that. Go ahead, Ms. Zuckerman. The Minister of Public Safety was informed by me that we were launching an investigation. He expressed concern over the nature of the allegations, and he indicated that he expected me to deal with any gaps that they showed and to go forward with the investigation and to let him know if there were any pertinent information that he should be aware of. He never said that he was looking for anybody's head on a platter. That's that. That's way before. That's way, way, way before Aaron. Um, now you, now you two are either deliberately missing each other or, or, or whatever. She asked, "How involved was the minister in the Arrive Can app?" Um, and it was Mendicino at the time. So um, usually they're not involved at all. Yeah. So uh, well, it depends. In something like this, you would expect the minister to be paying a lot of attention to, like the development of the Arrive Can app during the pandemic. Yeah, but he's going to be paying attention to things like deadlines and and functionality, not necessarily like, okay, Mister Programmer, what are you doing yeah, today? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, Humble Tracker, welcome to the chat with a uh, ten gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you so so much for that. Diane Sylvain with a five dollar super chat. Would Pierre not approve this line of questioning? I wonder. Just trying to make common sense out of all this. Um, yeah, we were talking about this a little earlier as, as well. Um, I don't know if he would get that involved in, in this. Um, uh, you would think that there's kind of a, a, a process for how this is uh, discussed and, and decided in committees, but um, uh, it's unknown at this point. So let's continue. Well, we were also uh, involved, I uh, apologize. That is our time, Mrs. Kusi. Uh, Ms. Atwin, over to you for six minutes and welcome back, Togo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good to see everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, and thank you so much to our witnesses uh, for, for coming back to the committee today. Um, I know last time it was a, you know, you're in the hot seat as well, and it was a, a bit of a difficult conversation, and it seems we're off to a similar start today. Um, but I'd really like to, I think, you know, Mr. Osowski, you mentioned the importance of, of highlighting just how much work, as well as Ms. O'Gorman, what the CBSA does for Canadians uh, protecting our borders. Um, I really think it's important for us to separate kind of what's happening here with this important <laughs> integral work that we have. Um, and of course, what they endured during the pandemic, uh, very much so the front line, um, dealing with a lot of the you know, pent up anger and hostilities, even from, you know, community members who are just dealing with the, the uncertainties of that time. So just want to thank you uh, for, for everything you've done. Um, and of course, for, your, you know, providing your testimony for this very important study. And we, we certainly all want to get to the bottom of, of what occurred. Um, so I very much appreciate your opening statements as well. And, you know, really what I'm going to do is just kind of take us through, um, again, step by step, how we kind of got to this, this place. Um, perhaps quite repetitive at this point, because again, um, this has been quite an ongoing saga. Um, but Ms. O'Gorman, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll begin with you. Um, can you confirm again for the committee, just for complete clarity, um, when the investigation into this matter was first launched, as far as your role as, as president? Sure. Um, in, um, I received information, I received the allegations in the fall of 2022, and I provided it to our um, um, Director General of Security, who launched an, launched an investigation in November. Great, thank you. Um, and of course, this investigation, it's, it remains ongoing. Is that correct? Yes. So we'll certainly know more, you know, once the investigation is, is complete. Um, and of course, the RCMP, they're also conducting their own investigation. Is that correct? I'm not aware of whether the uh, RCMP is, investing in, uh, is conducting an investigation. So as I've testified before, we provided um, the material that we received to the RCMP. They've indicated that should they wish to have any information, they will seek it through a production order, and we stand ready to give them whatever they, they seek. 
I, so I, I don't know if they are conducting an investigation. I yes, do know CRCMP they have the information and the allegations. Okay, thank you. Um, and I also in your opening statement, you mentioned a bit about some of the changes around procurement practices um, in the CBSA uh, since you've become president. Um, and just if you could further clarify some of those changes, you mentioned some really great ones. Um, I think particularly the, the senior oversight piece is, is really important just to ensure that everybody's got eyes on something. So hopefully we can avoid this in, in the future. Um, but can you just provide further detail to some of those changes um, and perhaps, you know, add clarity to were these changes instituted specifically because of you know, what we're seeing right now around the arrive can experience, as I'll call it, or or were there intentions to kind of tighten things up around procurement ahead of that? So I'll just speak to your, the first part of your question. Um, so some of the changes, indeed, um, all contracts, task authorizations are coming through a senior executive committee now to look to, to conduct a challenge function. And we've centralized all procurement into one branch. So what I've seen was a breakdown of roles and responsibilities. I saw engagements with contractors without seeing the presence of procurement officials. Pro procurement officials play an important role beyond signing documents. And so based on what I've seen, I felt that there was a breakdown and a lack of controls, and that's what I've put in place. There will be more recommendations to come. We'll calibrate. Um, perhaps I'll have uh, been found to have overreacted and, and slowed things down. Um, but right now, given what I've seen, um, that's what I've put in place. And at the same time, trying to use fewer contractors. Okay, a um, couple things. Uh, Paradoxy member for two months. Nice to see you. Maybe we should respect the fact that the Conservatives aren't whipping members to uh, hold an official party line. One MP is the whole party. Well, it's it's, it's not Paradoxy because we, we saw two or three different posts from two or three different MPs um, on the Conservatives that are in committee, and they were all basically saying the same thing yesterday. So it's not it's not just Stephanie Cousy. That was kind of what started our concern yesterday. Yeah, but, it started um, with uh, Janus. We saw it on his Twitter, and then last night we saw it on the, the live stream, and now Cousy today, and I had heard something was on her uh, her Twitter as well. So it seems to be like a tactic. Yeah. Um, Adam, uh, Canadian, with a $5 super chat. In my opinion, she seems to be trying to piss off the switch. Remember, she was called out by McDonald. Now they're uh, going to get fired. Suspicious for sure. So I'm starting to get an interesting impression. Um, but I will save my comments until after um, our our liberal friend has done her questioning. If, if she concludes like I think she will, then I'll have some feedback. Great. Uh, and just for the second part of that question, were there any intentions to tighten up kind of procurement processes or or look at improvements ahead of this arrive can experience, or is it really kind of coming out of what we've seen over the last few months? Coincided um, with me assuming this role, so um, I, I didn't have much runway to uh, examine or consider the procurement function. When I started, there was nothing glaringly absent, um, but some of this information and the allegations came to me early in my tenure, so I acted. Great. Um, and as our current president of the CPSA, uh, do you have faith in the organization's ability overall to follow fair procurement practices uh, moving forward? I have absolute faith in the organization, um, including in procurement practices. We're dealing and trying to get to the bottom of uh, a set of actions and um, work by individuals that you know, uh, I'm looking forward to an investigation to conclude on. Um, but I have absolute confidence in the CBSA and its application and adherence to policies. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Osowski, uh, if I can just switch to you now. Um, and again, bringing us back to this, you know, in the midst of the pandemic and some of the things um, that, were, that were being experienced and, and the necessity to act. And I'm just wondering, what data uh, were the provinces asked for at the onset of the pandemic? Um, and how is that data crucial to help in, inform public health officials on how best to protect Canadians from COVID-19 in the context of, of CBSA? Thank you for the question. Um, and it was actually quite interesting this past weekend reviewing my business records and seeing some of the back and forth in terms of the initial requirements. Provinces, in fact, were developing their own applications. Airports had developed some of their own applications. Mostly what we were interested in and the public health agency was wanting from us was the collector of collection of the contact tracing information. Where are you coming from? Name, address. This was being passed off to the provinces so they could monitor people on their arrival in case they needed to 
uh, ensure that their health was in yeah. place. I'm afraid I have to cut you off there because we're past our six minutes, but perhaps the next round. Okay. Here's my feeling on this. Um, this is speculation, complete. So I found a couple things interesting. The There was no questions about Cameron McDonald. There was not even any references to him existing. There was no references really to the investigation other than it was happening. Um, and she was very happy, very strange. So here's my thought. My thought is that the conservatives are not incorrect in that McDonald and Utano are probably going to be used by the, the liberals to be scapegoats. They're what's wrong with the, with the Arrive Can app, case closed. That makes sense to me, especially based on that initial lack of questions by, by the liberals. They don't even want to touch it. They don't want to go near it because they, they already know, right? Um, I don't like the way the conservatives, if that is the case, are trying to get there, but we'll see. We'll see how the foundation uh, ends up building the house. But that's just the initial read I get off of that liberal. So if I understand this correctly, the conservatives are anticipating that the liberals will say, look, it was all McDonald and Utano and, and go after those two. So the conservatives are trying to what? Blow it up. Well, say that they're innocent and it's actually the liberals fault. Well, they're, I think I th remember what I said, be first, right? So be first in that the conservatives anticipate that the liberals are going to try and bury this with McDonald and Utano. Um, and then when the liberals do that, it's easy for the conservatives to jump up and down and point at the liberals and say, see, we told you so. And everyone will remember that they told us so. And then, you know, it, it just proves the conspiracy, right? Because the, the conservatives were first in this. So that's not sitting right in my gut. Well, the pro that's the thing. So the problem with this is there's there's a way to do that without making them look like angels. But anyway, we'll see. That's just my initial thought on this. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, please, for six minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. O'Gorman. O'Gorman. Does CBSA have a policy or a rule to protect civil servants in case of uh, suits um, uh, linked to their employment? For instance, by paying their lawyer fees? For instance, by paying their lawyer's fees? We follow the um, Treasury Board policies. We are subject to those policies. Thank you. So before they were suspended, Mr. McDonald and Utano had lawyers helping them that were paid by CBSA. As I've said, I made decisions that align with the policies in place. I know certain things were um, published or certain sentiments were made public, but my answer is that I was in line with policies. So the lawyers were paid by CBSA following the policies and rules in place. Is that correct? I would say that there are two ways to pay lawyer, the lawyers, and I'm sorry, I will switch to English for this. This is before parliamentary committees mm -hmm. and in legal proceedings. Okay. And the criteria are set out. And I am consistent with that policy and the decisions that I've made. Actuellement, est-ce que currently are those two civil servants still covered by this protection policy? Do they still have lawyers whose fees are being paid by taxpayers, basically? If I receive requests. I can make decisions. I've made decisions for every request that I have received. 
Now, the usual meeting places for civil servants and potential or current service providers, where, where do those meetings usually take place? I would say it happens in the workplace. Yeah, I knew she was going to say that. Now, that's not to say that there are no meetings outside. There are no set rules. Um, no set rules about the exact location of such meetings. We do have a values and ethics code that we follow. There's the question of conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest, and that guides us when we decide how and where to meet with vendors. In the emails that you've sent us uh, this week, I saw many meetings, um, either weekly or biweekly, that took place in, in bars, that were in breweries, and uh, those were maybe meetings that lasting an hour, hour and a half. Is this usual? Is this recommended? Is it efficient? I mean, I'm sorry, but having a meeting in a brewery, I don't drink beer myself, but come on. This is the question that I want the conservatives to be asking. <laughs> like, okay, so what, um, what O'Gorman is saying for those that, uh, that may not be following and this line of questioning by Vignon is that, so you've been paying for the legal fees for Cameron McDonald and Tony Utano. Yes, yes, I have. So, um, why, you know, why, had, why did you stop? Well, you know, I did, you know, it's not that we stopped. We just, you know, haven't received other requests and, and I make decisions on each request. So basically she's saying every invoice that they get, she makes a decision whether or not to pay it or not. And Vignon is saying, well, you know, where do these meetings uh, typically uh, take place? And then Orgorman says, well, they typically take place in the workplace. And I thought she was going to say, and because, you know, they're not in the workplace anymore, they've been suspended, we're not paying them anymore. That's what I thought she was going to go with that. But then Vignon says, well, um, there was a whole bunch of meetings at bars and breweries and everything like that, lasting over an hour. So, you know, why are you paying legal fees for people to essentially go out drinking? On the taxpayer dime, by the way. This is all on the taxpayer dime. Of course it is. So, yeah. Keep going, Vigno. And before we continue, we have a super chat from Daniel. It says, in every system, there's the human factor. That's right. You can't always account for that. You, th you think it's going to go one way, and then because of the human factor, it goes completely sideways or backwards or... Just completely different than what you expected. Yeah. And we're also about 200 likes behind, so if you could please give us a thumbs up. It helps boost the algorithm. Let's go. Uh, three things on this. First of all, as I've said, the perception on conflict of interest matters. If I receive many... Um, many requests. I mean, the investigation is underway. I don't know if the people in question were there, but the presence itself of such invitations with vendors, where there's no proof that there was an employee from our side, is something that concerns me. I have questions about this. Mr. Osowski, in your opening remarks, you compared the internal data storage and external data storage offered by Deloitte. I'd like to talk about Amazon Web Services. Is that considered internal or external storage? From what I can see in the documents we've received so far, the applications have to be compatible and use that platform. So is it considered internal or external storage? Question. Actually, I don't think I'm qualified to question. answer that. <laughs> okay. you, okay. you need someone with a technology background. I mean, I think that the point was uh, that Mr. Duan was likely making was it was in an instance that was in the government's control 
as opposed to a private sector entity's instance uh, of where that cloud was, but I really can't comment on the technicalities of that. Okay. Um, so you probably remember that during the pandemic, Deloitte was in charge of everything regarding procurement in China, and I'm talking here about cargo shipping, planes, um, ships, in terms of masks and other PPE for Canada. Now, given this, would Deloitte have been available to to work on this web application? Uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I know so exactly she's saying where she's going. Canada was already working with Deloitte on other things. Why? Why were they not permitted to work with Deloitte on this? Well, why? So what? Yeah. So like, why? Why not Deloitte is basically what she's saying. Um, and I'll get to that right after I get to this. Mr. V with a six ninety nine super chat. NP is my only favorite channel. Your analysis are super awesome. Happy belated birthday. Wish I can hug you guys. Uh, will Brock Genius uh, Barrett show up? Um, if it's like yesterday, you will see uh, Brock and, and Genius. Brock, yep. Um, I don't think you'll see Mr. Barrett. Um, he's been involved he was in, in another scandal. Yeah, so. he's in the ethics committee. Yeah. I think that was yesterday. Yeah, and we'll yeah. be dropping a video about that tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. And David Payne, welcome to NP Supporter. Thank you very much. Welcome to the club. Okay, so um, what seems like Vignon is, is, is doing uh, with these technical questions is trying to lay a foundation for... Uh, the fact that since the government was already working with Deloitte on other projects and Deloitte already has experience with the government infrastructure and they have a huge team behind them, um, she's probably going after, you know, down the path of, you know, so we could have used Deloitte and maybe save some money rather than go through you know, these two guys and spend $11 million on this Arrive Can app. Because if you go through Deloitte, they already have a whole bunch of people on their bench that are technical. They uh, they don't have to go out and find another people and then charge you premiums, you know, premiums on premiums on premiums on top of that. Well, and it also proves that they weren't in the quote unquote penalty box, as we've been told in previous committees. 100% it proves uh, that. And and Osowski said as much. He said there's there's no... There's no evidence to say that they were in a penalty box. I don't recall anybody. I've talked with the people that I used to work with. Nobody remembers that. And there's no correspondence indicating that. And the other thing that he said is there's no emails with those packages from McDonald and Utano. That's a big piece of evidence, folks. Because when you're dealing with these guys, like these technical guys, they don't walk in to a CIO's office and give them paper and say... Here's here's the proposal that we have. No, no, it's via email. It's sent via email. So if if Osowski is saying there is no email with a package from Deloitte from Cameron McDonald, and there is no email with a package from Tony Utano for GC Strategies, that's a big piece of evidence. That means both McDonald and Utano were lying yet again. The trouble here is, is it's hard to trust anybody from the CBSA, including Osowski, including O'Gorman, because they've all been kind of proven to lie at some point. And remember what I said before, one lie undermines everything. So it's hard to know who the heck to believe anymore. Or did they have too much to do in terms of procurement for healthcare and PPE? Brief uh, answer, uh, I think. That, that, uh, that Deloitte was available okay. to provide this outsourced solution that was proposed. Merci. Mr. Johns, go ahead, please. NDP. Thank you very much for both of you for being here and coming back here and for the important work that you do and have done for Canada. Um, I just wanted to start with you, Ms. O'Gorman. I'm, I'm going to read from an email uh, Cameron McDonald sent to Ming Don. On November 19th, 2019, Cameron says Ming directed him to, quote, look into a specific domain within HR using AI, end quote. He says, quote, I found a company in Montreal and connected with GC Strategies who sought options to move something forward, end quote. That company was Bother AI. 
So what we have here is a government official saying they clearly identified a solution, yep. but they chose to bring in a middle person yep. to profit off it first. Yep. We've seen the direct message that GC Strategies sent to Bottler on LinkedIn. That's not professional headhunting that the government can't do itself. It really seems that GC Strategies was brought in as a middle person for no reason at all, except to profit off a taxpayer contract. Um, a tax taxpayer paid contract. And unless we see evidence to the contrary, that's what this shows. So Ms. O'Gorman, do you believe this is, is uh, acceptable? And with many more eyes on CBSA's procurements right now, have you found other cases where this has happened? And what is your plan to figure out whether this is happening in other cases? Okay, so good questions by Johns, yeah, despite the fact that he's NDP. <laughs> Um, and we've seen that before from him. Sometimes he is, you know, f you know, flat as a mat and other times he asks some decent questions. So this is one of those times where he's asking some decent questions and providing evidence, evidence that committee has. So that was important. So there's an email from Cameron McDonald to Mindone saying, I found a company and I have GC strategies looking into it. That is not an unsolicited proposal, which Cameron McDonald said that he had. That's what he said in committee. That was a lie. That email proves that was a lie. The conservatives have the same email. So clearly there's some method to their madness. Whether we agree with the method, that's yet to be... Uh, the jury's going to be out on that until the end of the video. I don't know. I'm still pretty angry. Yeah. So anyway... Um, SDK Reptiles was saying it gets worse and then we have uh, some other people saying it gets better. So maybe it gets worse before it gets better. I don't know. We'll see. I'll note your comment about unless other information comes to the fore. But to your question, um, I don't agree that that was proper procurement. No. It was not an unsolicited proposal. Right. The rules allow for prime contractors to sub, and as this committee has, has heard and asked about, sub-subcontract. It's not for CBSA or a department to try and manage and develop those subcontracts. Those are business decisions between entities in the course of a procurement. So what I have seen, based on the documents that you're referring to, CBSA's involvement in how those contracts would come together is not usual. Um, looking at other options, CBSA presumably could have put out an RFP for its requirements. It could have looked to justify a sole source. It could have used uh, supply arrangements and pre-qualified. So there were other options. It's not clear to me that what was happening was um, appropriate. In fact, it appears to be inappropriate. And the spirit of the supply arrangements and standing offers is not to retrofit products through them. Okay. So RFP, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, usually stands for Request for Proposal. What that is, it's a process that all companies have, and it's intended to solicit bids from vendors for a particular initiative that you're trying to do. So whether it's, you know, you're looking for a new piece of finance software or whether you're looking for a new order of furniture or whether you're looking for a new app to track people and their movements based on vaccination status, it's typical to go through this process. So what that is, is the company, they will put together this big document and lay out, this is what we're trying to achieve Here's all of our detailed requirements. This is what you have to have. And sometimes this is the time that we have to have it in. So you put that together and you throw that out to some specific vendors that you want. If it's an extended RFP, you will allow vendors to just come and take the RFP and then respond to it. So then you give them a deadline. Maybe it's a day, a week, two weeks. Usually it's a couple of weeks because big RFPs take long times to put together and then the vendors respond to that 
and then the organization will look at each RFP, see how the vendors responded to that by matching up what is their plan versus what your requirements are versus what the price is. And then there'll be usually some follow-up conversations and then they will select the contractor based on that process. So that's what she's talking about on our RFP. She then talked about sole source justification. So what that is, is if a organization, and this is, this is government speak, if a agency decides that they have an initiative, but they only want to select one vendor, they have to justify that. They have to, um, they have to put together this big document that says there's a reason why we're only picking GC strategies, and here's the reason: for efficiency, for time, um, for cost. You know, there could be a myriad of reasons, but that is what a sole source justification is. Um, so that's just. That's, that's the, the big and boring bureaucracy behind uh, procurement that uh, happens at most organizations. And please hit that like button. We're about 170 behind. Would be the, this be your rationale for the suspensions then? The suspensions of the companies? No, the employees. I didn't, Mr. McDonald. I didn't suspend the employees. Okay, it's my understanding that is Mr. McDonald not suspended? So neither Mr. McDonald nor Mr. Utano work for the CBSA. I have no authority over them. Their deputy heads have taken action. Okay, understanding that, what's your plan to figure out whether this is happening in other cases? Have you looked to see if this is taking place in more than this instance? So uh, twofold, uh, I have the investigation underway and the investigation is going to canvas all of those issues and I have a, a committee set up that's looking at every contract and asking oh, the excellent. questions okay. and trying to understand before any approvals are given. Okay, now that you've got this committee working, has the committee come back to you already and flagged other contracts that are of concern? So um, the committee is forward looking. Um, we are reviewing documents relating to contracts on ArriveCAN and the billing around that. Um, so. Uh, to your question, I have the internal investigation that will be canvassing how CBSA was engaging with contractors during this period, not limited to Botler GC strategies. So I look forward to those conclusions. I look forward when to... When do we expect to have those conclusions? I mean, this could run for years, right? We don't want that. Oh. We want to make sure that we get results. That's what this committee wants. I'm very impatient. I need to make sure I don't translate that impatience into undue pressure. I'm trying to preserve the integrity of the investigation. I'm impatient, and I, I hope that everybody involved will participate so that we can wrap it up as soon as possible. I would hesitate to give a date at this time. Okay. Um, Mr. Azowski, you know, we've been told that GC Strategies was chosen over Deloitte because Deloitte was in the penalty box, and you commented about that earlier, but it was highlighted that it was for its poor wrote poor work on the CARM contract, but Mr. Doan says that's not the reason. So why was Deloitte in the penalty box or, or even aware of why? And what was the nature of the problems with Deloitte's it, work? There was no penalty box. And that's what he's going to say now. As I said in my opening remarks, the relationship was businesslike and cordial at that time. No one was in the penalty box. There you go. I reviewed all the emails and there's nothing to suggest it was this. anything Drew, come different on. than that. Sorry, okay, Mr. Gorman, can you comment on Sorry, that? Sorry, Mr. Johns. Uh, Drew Johns is the, the good guy in our role. members. <laughs> Gore Johns I can't is comment guy. about the statements that were be made, um, but I would say that the cordial and business-like relationship continues. So Deloitte's never been in the penalty box, or in, in your view, under your watch? And you're not aware of that in the past? No. There you go. This is confirming another one of Butler's assertions, and it's calling Cameron McDonald a liar yet again. And I'm going to be calling Philip Chisholm for a $10 super chat. That is your first on a live stream. Thankfully, it is with us. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much for the donation. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. So Jones. Was, okay. yeah. Mr. Brock, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. O'Gorman, your responses to the questions 
put to you by my colleague, Ms. Cousy, as to why both uh, Mr. McDonald, who was a Director General of the CBSA, and Mr. Antonio Utano, who was um, a Vice President of uh, the CBSA, as to why they were suspended without pay, I find your responses to be lacking in clarity. Clearly you know a lot more. Uh, we're going to ask you questions about that because uh, Canadians deserve a full, frank answer as to why both of these senior civil servants have been treated in the fashion that they have. And these are extremely unusual circumstances, so much so that uh, the report put, up, put forth by uh, Bill Curry in the Globe and Mail um, was able to, uh, to, to speak with the former uh, clerk of the Privy Council office, Mr. Michael Wernick, who said that uh, public finger pointing by senior servants is highly unusual. He cannot recall any other instance of such public disagreement. Is it an outlier? Yes. Suspensions without pay are also rare. It's a strong measure to suspend without pay while a process is underway and no conclusions have been reached. Usually disciplinary measures follow an investigation being completed and suspension with pay is more common in the early stages, he said. It's also a very strong measure to suspend or permanently revoke a security clearance. It is tantamount to removing someone from that job and any other job that requires that level of clearance. It is not a common occurrence. Your decisions at the CBSA as directed and delivered to the other ministries these two individuals have worked for have destroyed their lives. And Canadians deserve an answer, parliamentarians deserve an answer as to why due process was not provided to them, that very draconian measures were taken against them. So I'm going to be asking you a number of questions. Who I wonder. I wonder, wonder who, ba -doo -boo -doo. not who wrote the Book of Love. <laughs> um, what I'm wondering is if... Okay, is if the strategy is this. Um, before I get to this, I'll get to that, which is Justin Brown in a 279 Super Chat. Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate that. And another 10 gifted uh, Northern Perspective memberships from Humble Tracker. Thank you so, so much. Thank you both. Um, okay, so. What are you thinking? Because I'm thinking. Are the, So it, it feels like what Brock is doing or is going to do is to it almost feels like reverse psychology in a way um it feels like they're it feels like they're they're trying to almost deliberately undermine the alleged results of the cbsa investigation to get aaron o'gorman to say publicly at committee what they found that that's what it feels like. That's a theory. Um, to say no, our investigation is fine. This is what they did, and then everyone can say "aha" to get it on public record. That's what it kind of feels like. Um. So, yeah, that's that's what I'm getting kind of from this. Um. Because all the questions. Stephanie Cousy went really hard over, oh, these guys have it been suspended. Like, it was overacting, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you ask me. It, it was. Um, but, it, but, but if you strip away the, the drama from it, it was all around, these guys have been suspended. Why? Brock took a cerebral approach like he usually does, and, he's, and he was saying, you know, um, Curry was saying that this, in his article, that this is very rare. We saw that. We, we read it to everybody. And that it typically follows an investigation. Now, what he was, um, what he was lacking, and he and he didn't go this far is, and and he knows he knows what like what, what that would be. So he doesn't go far to say that the reason why you would permanently revoke someone's security status immediately and suspend them with pay is if the investigation found criminality 
that's like literally in Brock's wheelhouse. So it's like they want the either president to admit this. Here's a theory, and this is just a theory. We don't know this for sure. The theory is that they suspended them without pay because they've already taken enough taxpayer money. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, Humble Tracker with a $100 super chat. Thank you so much. Hugs to both of you. May the likes break the 1K mark. You heard her. You heard her, everybody. So please hit that like button, and thank you very much, Humble Tracker. So, um, Cypher, wonder, wonder, wondering, you will be saying, holy... <laughs> holy coffee <laughs> <laughs> holy coffee beaver <laughs> so um and... I, I hope so because I'm, I'm really sitting here stewing like i'm not i'm not getting a good vibe we do have some information that we're we're going to share later i'm not sure if it, it's what this is um you know i saw a little sneaker out there i'm not going to give any hints away to, to anybody who who hasn't seen it but anyway uh, Louise A. King with a five dollar super chat. They are using uh, the ones that got suspended to get the bigger fish. I, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's kind of the theory. But I, just the way they're kind of like making them out to be heroes and whistleblowers, and they're not whistleblowers. They didn't come to the government. If it was up to them, they wouldn't have gone to committee at all. Well, and again, I don't, I don't. Maybe that's the reverse psychology, right? So to to get O'Gorman and Osowski say these guys are the furthest thing from from whistleblowers you know this you know they did all of this stuff like I yeah don't know. but now it's out in the public and that to me is the real issue i know i know um diane sylvain with a ten dollar super chat and i see you diane so here are my thoughts uh, the conservatives are after facts about the investigation uh, found bringing about the unusual circumstances of suspension without pay and loss of security clearance yeah um and it's just their their method of getting that is is the peculiar part about this and kimberly patterson with a 1399 super chat that's your first on the live stream thank you very much not sure if you intended to uh to type something as a message kimberly or not but um barnaby if you want to keep an eye out for kimberly patterson if she did and uh we will make sure to uh, to say that let's keep going mr brock who did you speak with, ma'am, on suspending the two public servants on the 54 million Arrive Can app? You said it wasn't your decision, but clearly you participated in, in the ultimate recommendation that they be removed. Who did you speak with? That's not accurate at all. I didn't speak to either of their deputy heads about the actions they were taking. You received a preliminary report from investigators in your department. Did those investigators recommend suspension? No. Who did? The decisions were taken by the deputy heads. I shared the preliminary statements of fact with their deputy heads. There you go. What did the, what did the preliminary statements of fact, how was it so damning against those two individuals that you felt it prudent to pass on to the other ministries? There you go. That's the game. So he's trying to get her, her to say, this is what it is. She's probably going to come back and say, I don't want to reveal those facts until investigation is done. Brock will probably come back and say, well, then why did you reveal those in the first place? That's This is probably the dance that we're going to see. Uh, Johnny O, 699 Super Chat. Thank you so much. These two were suspended for what happened when they worked... Um, forever uh there must uh forever there 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 must be some sort of result from the investigation um yeah and uh and and everyone needs to remember that um cameron mcdonald never worked for aaron or gorman he only worked for john osowski i can't recall if utano was still there while when o'gorman came in o'gorman came in and the uh, late summer, I think it was July of 2022. It, was, um, it included, in, as the emails that, that you have received, information about engagements with consultants, um, a whole series of information that, as their deputy heads, I felt they had a right to have. They did not consult me on their actions. Why did you claim that they were a national security risk? that were you aware that that was the language that was used in their suspension letters i haven't seen their suspension letters you're completely blind to that you had no knowledge of that i'm not their deputy head they don't and the deputy me. head never spoke to you at all 
They, they alone made that decision? They alone made is, that is decision. Is your evidence today? They alone made that decision. Okay, so identify those deputy heads for us, please. Who are they? Um, Bob Hamilton is the commissioner of the CRA, and Stephen Lucas is the deputy head of Health Canada. How many communications did you have with both of those individuals? I let them know that I would be sharing wow. a... Pre pardon? How did you let them know? Emails? Telephone um, call? Letter? I, I called them, and I indicated... When did you call? When? When? Um, soon after I received it. I received uh, the package the 19th of December. Did you up with an email? Um, possibly. Okay. Um, You'll provide this committee with any and all ma manners of communication to those two deputy heads surrounding the preliminary findings from your investigators in your ministry. You can do that? And, and, the, and you uh, can have that to us within two weeks? Okay. Yeah. Did they communicate back to you? They told me after the facts, the after the fact, the decision they had taken. They communicated that they took the decision to suspend without pay. They informed me that they had taken actions. And they communicated that to you in what manner? Um, in a phone call, as I recall. Nothing official, nothing, no email, no letter. No just a phone to call. Inform me officially, they are the deputy heads of those employees. Right. That we're taking the most drastic yeah, of Can you remedies wrap up, Mr. Brock? against that we're taking the most drastic of remedies against these two whistleblowers who spoke truth to power, and they only communicated that via telephone. The employees work for them. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Oh, it's gross oh, hearing Brock say that. It is gross. Uh, Peter H. with a $10 super chat. Because you guys deserve it for your work. I appreciate you guys. Well, thank you thank very you much very for much. that, Peter. We need it tonight, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, we're not too happy with uh, with this scheme. But, um, <laughs> Junior Sewell with a six ninety nine super chat. Your first on a live stream. It's Junior Sewell who keeps telling us, just wait, guys. It, it'll get better. He's our therapy today. So, yep. um, so you, thank you. You'll have to keep saying that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sewell or Mrs. Sewell. Um, Milady loves cats with a thirteen ninety nine super chat. I really, really appreciate uh, you two's unbiased comments. How freaking refreshing! Even though you lean right, uh, the fact that you call out uh, doubtful behavior uh, is to your great credit. Thank you very much. Thank you. I um, mean, we try really, really hard yeah, to do that. Yeah, you can, you can, like support somebody but agree that they're doing something wrong. Um, I mean, think of think of the people in your life, like people that you care about, people that you love. You love them, but if they do something dumb, you're going to tell them, wow, that was really dumb. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that's that's how you know um, you have a good friend is if they're willing to call you an idiot when you're being an <laughs> idiot <laughs> and still have a beer with you, right? So, um, But the interesting thing I gained from this interaction was that the the department heads for Utano and McDonald said that they were a security risk and therefore that's probably why their security clearances were revoked. Right. So why are they security risks? Well, that's the thing we don't know. This is where it's a little sketchy because I so this this is this is where it's odd. We don't know all of the information that O'Gorman has provided committee. Now she has said, I have provided you the information that I provided to the deputy heads. So Brock, Kuzi, all of them have this. Okay. Now, unless they are of the mindset that the information provided does not detail at all why they would be a national security risk. Okay. Um, there'd be no reason for them to ask that question. So what sort of things do we think might s cause somebody to say, oh yes, this employee who had previously received clearance is now a security risk? So number one, if they are caught disseminating government information outside of government channels, that would be one. Um, if they were literally caught committing a crime, that would be another. Um, if they're caught liaising with foreign actors, unauthorized, that would be another. Um, you know, we, we saw evidence 
yesterday that Von Brennan received an email from John Osowski that was an internal CBSA email. So that means somebody in the CBSA sent that email out to Christian Firth, which was then um, sent to, uh, to Von Brennan. So that indicates that at least somebody was doing that. That was probably Cameron McDonald. And um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, that was my fault. Uh, Humble Tracker with a $100 super chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, chat, for making it to 1K. You're all warriors. Epic thanks. Can we make it to 2K? No, we can't. Um, and the likes less... are over 1K and the views are over yeah, 1K. Awesome. Uh, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much, chat. Um, but, uh, anyhow, um, since my train of thought is off the rails and gone, let's just keep going. Yeah, I derailed that one. Uh, Mr. Baines, over to you, please. Oh, no. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, you, Baines. I'm gonna go back to Mr. Skowski, you were, um, Ugh, this guy. Oh, you were trying to inform us a my little pulp. bit about this guy. the ArriveCan app and, and, uh, and the centralization of it in order for it not to fall through uh, cracks of uh, uh, airport and provincial apps. Could you maybe finish that? You, were, I think you were trying oh, to... Sorry, let me interrupt no, you, Mr. Baines, for a moment. I'll stop the clock. Madame uh, Legnon? Le son est trop mauvais pour l'interprétation et j'aimerais uh, éminemment entendre... Uh, the sound is not good enough for interpretation and I would like to hear the questions asked by my colleagues, so maybe if he could move his microphone closer to his mouth. Que je puisse entendre ces oh, questions via l'interprétation. Um, uh, can you please move the microphone closer to your mouth so that I can hear the interpretation? How about now? Is this good? Is this better? Could we get him to speak Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, thank Ozowski, you for the heads I'm going to go that, back to you. Um, you. You are reflecting as um, uh, on on your that was observation Lisa and uh, you, um, what you notice when when you are going to through uh, a number of emails and you are talking about uh, the 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 reach out to you or the outreach to you around. Uh, various requirement from various provinces and all of those things. Can, can you expand on that? And um, had, had we not gone with the RiveCan the way we did, um, what would be potentially the impact? People would have been able to fly where they want. Um, Adam Canadian with a $5 super chat. Thank you so much, sir. They are Trudeau and Freeland's exposure risk, AKA security risk. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the fact that a lot of this communication happened over phone that's kind of bizarre yeah because i mean in any office but i imagine especially a government office where you know you've got people in this building and that building and some working from home and whatever it's going to be email primarily yeah and one of the only reasons why you would avoid email communication is to skirt around an atip request so that's the access to information uh, request that Cameron McDonald or Utano could make. So it's, or anybody really. So it's peculiar. Um, so that was the one piece around Brock's questioning that I found very odd. And I, and he found odd about that as well. Um, so let's continue here. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, I think the best, you know, when I was looking through my emails, the best way I would describe it is that um, and the, the memories that I uh, re were refreshed was the airports were clogged with people trying to fill out paper forms. People then would get garbage bags full of these paper forms and have to digitize them so that information could be passed to provinces. You might recall at some point provinces were looking at checking in on people to see if they're okay. They were trying to make sure that they were enforcing mandatory isolation. Initially it was done on a sampling basis and then it moved to something more persistent. I think the initial piece at the airport as well was complicated because you had all these... Which was completely totalitarian and everybody agrees on that except the government. And Heartsinger with a 699 super chat. I may be addicted to your channel. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Better than uh, than mainstream media. Well, we appreciate Thank you. That. It's a good thing to be addicted to. Yes. People getting off an airplane all at the same time. And they were concerned, quite frankly, of a super spreading event happening while they were waiting doing the paper process. 
So it was logical to sort of look for some way to capture this information in advance if possible. And there was a web-based version of this as well for people who didn't have a mobile app. So that we could capture that very simple information, give it to the provinces, and as well allow the public health agency to do the analytics to say, okay, this person came from this country, this is what variant that turned out to be following the testing. Um, it was um, much, much more sophisticated and much, much more effective than a paper process. Yeah, thank you. So the reference to a $54 million uh, uh, bongle is, is not really true because uh, can, can you share with us, if you do know, the, the, the dollar cost of the development of the application? Okay, stop. <laughs> you don't even know how to say the word. So it's, it's not a it's not a fifty four million dollar bongle. <laughs> I miss that. You're a bongle. <laughs> and so, yes, it's a it, it, it's a boondoggle. But you know so what I'm kind of focused on right now is what Oswalski was saying about oh you know people were just clogging up hallways and stuff with the paper doing paperwork and why didn't you give it to them on the plane? Isn't that what they do with customs forms? You yes. know the stewardess comes around is like here fill this out and tell us how much money you spent overseas. Yes. Why not with the health information too? Like if if that's what you're going to do, why not do it while everybody's sitting on the plane? And then they're like, oh, we're worried about, you know, super spreaders in the hallways and stuff. Everybody's just been in a tin can together for like four plus hours. Yeah, what's another Is that minutes? not your, is not, yeah, none of that makes sense. Well, and they, and usually customs, they give it to you 15 minutes before you land. I got to read this comment by Scott Graham. Joe Ari's voice killed radio. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. I was going to say something else, but my uh, my brain is uh, evidently a little behind tonight. So And your wife keeps interrupting you. Well, yeah, that's, that's the <laughs> other problem. I don't have those details, but I remember you asking me a similar question on December 8th of 2022 when I first appeared. And I think at the time, the estimate was the processing of a paper form was about $3 per form and that the application was, I don't know, we, I think we talked about $60 million people use the application or 60 million tra travelers and that worked out to about 65 cents per form. But I think I want to take the opportunity if I may in terms of the cost of this. Um, unlike all of the other references this committee has heard to what an app costs to development, we did not know the requirements at the time. We did not have the luxury of weeks of thinking about how do we want to situate this, what are the true business requirements, what data we have. As you can appreciate from my remarks, the, what we were dealing with was um, a million different things at once, quite frankly, and this constantly evolved as we brought in new measures and the public health agency, along with our provincial counterparts, tried to prevent the spread of the disease based on what was coming into the country. And that's where we tried it to help them. And so, you know, these references, well, we could have done an app cheaper than this. It was not the same situation by any means whatsoever. So let's, let's talk about that for a bit. So what, what Osowski is saying is, listen, it's easy to retrospectively look at this and say, you could have built an app like that in a weekend. He's saying that when we were initially trying to build this app, they literally just said, go build something and you have no requirements. That would have been difficult. However, $54 million, no thank you. Well, especially when they've already determined, I'm um, almost positive, that Christian Firth got, what was it, $11.2 million just for doing nothing? Yep. Yep. So, um, and you know how much over, how much extra cost it would have been to have people inside the government build this? Nothing. From an effort perspective, nothing. All you would pay is the extra infrastructure. So hire some people with that skill set and get it done. Like that's that's what they would have had to do. Requirements could have changed every day and it still would have cost the same because it would just be burned by salary. So I, I don't I don't accept your premise that it's fifty four million dollars because we didn't have requirements. I don't accept that. And I also don't accept your postulation that, well, you know, 
um, a, a farm used to cost three dollars and uh, and now it costs 65 cents well the argument would be that it should have cost a hell of a lot less than 65 cents per person then well be unless it was one of those ones with like a bazillion carbon copies underneath i imagine those are more than just like regular paper or, or even print services but still like none of this makes sense no like what i'm talking about is the 65 cents uh, per person as a result of the app cost oh. at, at 54 million dollars so it should have cost the the app should have cost under a million easily right so which means that it should have been around 10 cents per person not 65 cents well and the thing is okay so app costs 54 million dollars and there's about 40 million Canadians in this country. So even if every single person in this country used that app, it's still a buck 35. Well, but he's trying to say that it's not the number of people, it's the number of travelers. So you, you would have people traveling multiple times, so they're using the app multiple times, still, just though, like you would be using the forum multiple that's times. That's such a weak argument. Yes, it is. Yeah. J j just as a reference for the committee, I believe the development cost of the application with 70 a uh, different iteration that was coming on a rapid fire was around nine million dollars yeah which is absolutely ridiculous and what isn't ridiculous is the uh super chat by trish pruel thank you very much for the five dollar super chat confession time i too am addicted to this channel crocheting and northern perspective my ultimate night uh that's awesome trish thank you very much oh uh, let us know in the comments what you're making and the dude with a five dollar super chat the liberal party should be renamed the bongo party <laughs> <laughs> now you're on to something Pardon me. And Tony Petipas with a 279 Super Chat, two hockey games, and Northern, pers Northern Perspective, my brain hurts. <laughs> oh, there you go. So the reference to the fact that this application has cost $54 million of development uh, is not, uh, it, it's not factually correct. Uh, quickly going to Ms. O'Gorman. Um, in your opening remarks, you talked about uh, that... Um, the investigation had led uh, to uh, information that you shared with uh, with other department heads, and then they made the decision that they made. Um, also, some of our colleagues uh, uh, in the opposite side refer to the statement that you provided was not a true statement. Uh, uh, Madam O'Gorman, can, can you tell us why did you ask for an in-camera meeting uh, as opposed to a public meeting. I know the answer to that. It's because she's going to say, because then I could talk openly about what we found in the investigation. That's probably what she's going to say. As I said, I, I'm trying to balance information that this committee is seeking with the integrity of investigation that remains ongoing and that hasn't heard from key individuals. So I am anxious for that to conclude. And I'm very conscious of not prejudicing that investigation. Um, CBSA conducts uh, internal investigations. Individuals who have been subject to those investigations have talked to me about how stressful they can be, whether they're respondents or even witnesses. So I can't imagine the stress that would cause somebody who's subject to an investigation with such a public profile. There I'm concerned go. about people's mental health. I would like the investigation to have the space to conclude, and I would like to protect its integrity. Those were the reasons why I asked. Thank you very much. And Mr. Jouari, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, Mrs. Vignola for two and a half, please. Thank you. So um, just to unpack that uh, quickly. So she's essentially saying, I asked for in camera because she knew she was going to be asked about what was in the investigation, and she wants to not taint the investigation and you know C Cameron McDonald would have been watching this testimony and she would not want to taint the investigation or reveal to that person over national television what they found against them in that investigation so that's basically her reason there um, she doesn't want to affect the mental health of Cameron McDonald oh, how considerate of you um, but that's basically what she's saying. So she asked for in camera, meaning not in the public eye, so she could talk openly about that. But because it's not in camera and it is in the public eye, she won't talk openly about that. Can she refuse questions like that at committee, though? No, because she's already provided that evidence via in written form. The committee has it. That's the strange thing about all this. No. 
very much, Mr. Chair. Ms. O'Gorman, as far as you know, are there public servants or higher-ups that would have made pressure or pressured people that would have uh, testified in committee? So, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Utano, Ms. Doc, would they have been sent to cease and desist letters or other uh, other legal documents? Well, again, we yes. should wait for the conclusion of the um, investigation. In testimonies, different informations have been have been shared. Sure, I understand what whistles are being blown. I want to get to the bottom of what happened. I have trust in the investigation, and I look forward to it concluding. Yeah, we don't understand what uh, whistles are being blown as well. But um, Adam uh, Canadian just blew ten dollars on our uh, our live stream with a super chat. Thank you so much for that. Always welcome, Cipher and Fox. Wish I could do more truly, but Trudeau steals too much from me uh, weekly for draconian apps. You guys are a great Canadian class act for sure. Love you guys. Thank you, and we love you too, Mr. Adam Canadian. Thank you. Thank you so very much. much. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, stop referring these to, to McDonald and Utano as whistleblowers. What have they blown the whistle on? Nothing. Like, yeah. Junior Silva with a 699 Super Chat. Cypher and Fox, I am in Newfoundland. Love the channel. I also have some Newfoundland souvenirs for you. Get in touch with me. Um, so send us an email. Um, if uh, uh, Barnaby, if you wouldn't mind throwing our email in the chat. Um, that's, the, that's the best way to get back to us. And we will... Uh, see what we can send you back in terms of information and um, uh, and for the uh, the other people that you were talking about. That's going to be the way that we can share that. Uh, Craig Robertson, member for one month. Thanks for helping me stay sane while watching this. Your frustration is helping shed light to these important issues. Stay awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, I admit these are these wonderful comments are helping us stay a little calm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was pretty fired up earlier. And Don Wickenden with a $5 super chat. I have more rules that can find fire or jail me on any given day as a job. How do these clowns hold their jobs? Uh, MTO, Ministry of Transportation Ontario, would retire them on a scale. Yes, they sure would. Il y a eu des pressions. C'est en dehors de votre... And so if there was pressure, that is... That has nothing to do with you, and uh, these people acted of their own volition. They were their own decisions. Yes. During this investigation, did you ask that the investigators uh, meet with everyone involved? Was there a request uh, for meetings? I think that Butler AI was asked to share the information that they had in their possession. I don't know if the team asked to meet with Butler AI. When I read the contract uh, or the call for tenders, I saw that there were some linguistic uh, demands and that everything was done in English. Uh, we are, or they were asked to work in English only. F and French, when it is mentioned, which is quite rare, it, there's a condition. So you could have to work bilingually. So not only in French, but in a bilingual manner whereas English is mandatory. So Chinese programmers, Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian programmers only program in English as well? Or can we hire specialists that speak another language? You didn't leave it. Um, listen, Vignola, <laughs> when it comes to programming languages, they are what they are. <laughs> yeah, it's like C++ and Python and stuff. It's not French, English, Spanish. It just <laughs> is. <laughs> Come on. Give me a break. Um, like, I thought she had some sort of technical background. Anyway. I guess not. <laughs> whatever. But, um, 
I, I, I love this super chat. I uh, absolutely love it. Thank you, Robert McFallon, for a $10 super smile super chat. Uh, Fox and I were trying not to burst out laughing uh, while she was talking. Every legacy media quote-unquote journalist ain't fit to carry your jock strap. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Gonna be, it's going to be fun listening to myself say that over and over again after this is done. Enough time for an answer, but perhaps you can get back to that in the next round. Uh, Mr. Johns, please, for two and a half. Yeah, Ms. O'Gorman, uh, can you please tell me the date in which CBSA officials commenced the internal investigation into Bottler's allegations, as well as the date in which the Bottler task authorization was cancelled? back um the investigation was uh, late fall in november i believe i don't know the exact date and i don't know when the task authorization was cancelled that was before i was at the agency okay i thought mr mcdonald said that the investigation started in january but i'll go to the next question i have a few questions about mr mcdonald's claims that cbsa was covering his and mr utano's legal fees when did cbsa begin covering their fees with private legal counsel who made that decision? And does this include legal fees related to the RCMP investigation for McDonald and Utano? So I'm going to speak generally um, about covering legal fees. There are um, criteria um, in terms of determining whether legal fees should be covered. The criteria are different for appearances before parliamentary committees and legal investigations. Any requests that I received to cover legal fees were consistent with the policy. Okay, okay. Do you recognize the, the concerns and you know the conflict of interest in using taxpayer dollars to fund the private legal counsel of yes, the same yes, individuals we do. for Everybody does. investigation by the RCMP, by this committee, and by your own agency? So I'll just clarify. I, I don't know if anybody is under investigation by the RCMP. I have no information oh. about that one way or the other. Um, I applied the Treasury Board policy on, on legal fees for uh, public servants. Okay, so thank you very much for that information, Heron O'Gorman. By, by omitting information, you actually informed all of us as to what you covered the legal fees for. So what it sounds like is... When McDonald and Utana were about to come to committee, they sought legal counsel and they sought the CBSA to pay for that legal counsel. Then why, when they were in committee, did they say that they were receiving no help whatsoever from the government? This is and this is another lie. Because and and, and McDonald refutes his own lie. Right? Unless Unless what he's talking about is the RCMP was already talking to him. Unless that's what he's talking about. But again, I don't believe a word McDonald says. Yeah, I think what's getting me the most about this is they keep calling him a whistleblower. The guy's not a whistleblower. He's a snitch. There's a difference. Yeah, exactly. He's a narc. <laughs> okay. Um, so can you explain why the Department of Justice wasn't uh, taking the lead in terms of providing counsel. And also, just lastly, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you could table the date in which the internal investigation into Butler's allegations were made, if you could table that to this committee. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for all that. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Oops. <laughs> I can provide that. I'm sorry. You we can, can provide that in writing? We can provide the date. <laughs> And, and to your other question about legal fees, oh, there's, there's um, can you repeat the question? Sucks. Why wasn't the council being provided by the Department of Justice? That's a great question. I will um, speak generally uh, about the process and... Just, just briefly, please. So I, I applied the policy, and it does contemplate whether there's a conflict of interest um, that, that's in the policy. It, set, it sets out the considerations to be made. Okay, so you're allowed to pay for them, but you're not allowed to provide them. <laughs> uh, okay, that's an interesting policy. Humble Tracker with another 10 Northern Perspective gifted memberships. Thank you very, very much for that. Everybody, if you have received a membership, which I see some people have, please give Humble Tracker the love that she deserves. 
Thanks very much. Mr. Barrett, please. Barrett is here. Mr. Gorman, in your calendar, there are um, multiple visits to uh, the address 80 Wellington. And uh, while this building is on Wellington Street, it's not 80 Wellington. 80 Wellington is the Prime Minister's office. These visits are interspersed uh, or spaced around your times appearing at Arrive Can hearings for the Government Operations Committee. For example, before your appearance at the Government Operations Committee on the 24th of October in last year, you visited the Prime Minister's office at 2 p.m., mm -hmm. then walked across the street and sat down to take, uh, to take questions. Uh-oh. Doesn't sound good. Uh-oh. All right. Junior, junior, sir, is this where it gets good? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, Don said, wait, 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 wait for it, wait for it. All right, here we go. The next morning, you were back at the Prime Minister's office. Who did you meet with in these meetings? I have not met with the Prime Minister. The Privy Council office is in that building. I would have been at 80 Wellington to attend... Um, meetings with colleagues in the Privy Council office. So none of your meetings at 80 Wellington had any relation to the Arrive Can, uh, the Arrive Can scandal or your testimony at this committee? No. I, I have spoken to colleagues in the Privy Council office about Arrive Can. Certainly there's a big public profile to Arrive Can. They've had questions. Um, but uh, you're, you're linking specific meetings and specific appearances here that have no relation to one another. I have come to give this testimony free of, of putting anything by anybody else. So the suggestion that I would have been meeting with the Privy Council office in advance of this meeting is not accurate. My calendar shows many, many meetings at 80 Wellington. You did meet with people uh, at that office before this meeting. So it is accurate to suggest that. It's, it's an assertion of fact. So you just said it's inaccurate to say that you met there before this meeting. You did, ma'am. Not on arrive, Ken. Okay. Well, um, it's, uh, it's certainly interesting that your appearances at the um, Privy Council office or the Prime Minister's office um, are directly around your appearances at, at this committee. I think you'll In see many, many meetings at 80 Wellington around all sorts of other meetings. You said you spoke to colleagues in the Privy Council office about, uh, about this meeting. Did you speak about your testimony at this committee with, with uh, folks at PCO? I didn't say that I met with colleagues about this meeting, um, but I did indicate that I was yes. coming. Yes. I, I indicated that I was coming, and um, I shared my opening remarks with them. They didn't... Uh, they acknowledged receipt. Why would you do that? Miss O'Gorman, why would you do that? And that's a contradiction. He said, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't meet with him about this meeting. I, sh I just shared my opening remarks. What? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make, doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would you need to share your opening remarks if it wasn't about this meeting? Right, and this is the Privy Council office. That's Justin Trudeau, everybody. And Freeland's in there too, isn't she? Justin Trudeau, yeah, she, she's, she's on the Privy Council. Ju uh, Justin Trudeau heads the Privy Council office. This is why you can't trust anybody. Well, you know, up until this point, I was thinking, I don't trust her just because I know I shouldn't. But she's she, done okay. She's, yeah, she's done. She's given pretty good testimony, and I haven't seen any major crop ups. <laughs> and this seems to be the first. This I is think. a big problem. Yeah. Like, this is going to come back to bite her. Well, look at the look on her face. Yeah. That, that says everything. Oh, I shared my opening remarks. Barrett's going to jump all over that one. October 13, 2022, there was a meeting in your calendar uh, that was Procurement Services uh, Canada and CBSA on ArriveCan, PSPC, PSPC and CBSA ArriveCan. Did you attend that meeting? Can you say the title of the meeting again? 
October 13, 2022, PSPC and CBSA, Arrive Can. Did you attend the meeting? I, I don't recollect if it was in my calendar. It's a year and a half um, ago. I, I likely did, but I don't recollect that meeting in particular. Well, it seems that the meeting would have been important to your committee strategy because we have an email um, on October 21st where it stated, quote, both PSPC and CBSA push to have all departments do remarks if they can for time management and putting our narrative out there. So it seems like there was a time management strategy uh, developed. It relates directly to um, your appearance at, at committee. Do you have any recollection of it now with, with that uh, having been offered? That's interesting. Got to control the narrative before they go into committee in the fall of 2022, right? Interesting. Ryan Poplinski with a uh, with a shout out member for two months. Tonight I drank from a paper straw. Man, I was angry that it wasn't a plastic straw. Oh man, <laughs> brutal. And we also want to say hi to our friend Construction Cronies who's in the chat. Oh, it's about time you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should all check out his channel after. He does really interesting and uh, very thorough work regarding uh construction it's it's pretty cool and he it's okay he hasn't been here in a while he's been busy we'll get to that uh a little later not tonight but a little later sorry would you be able to uh table for this committee would you be able to table for this committee um the uh, uh prep materials that you would have had or a or a slide deck um do you have the title of the slide deck on uh, on um, lessons learned? Uh, Arrive can lessons learned. Are you familiar with that document? I am. Could you table that with the committee? Uh, I believe if if it's the one I'm thinking of, um, it was presented to the Treasury Board. Um, but yes, I can. You undertake to present to provide that to the committee. Thank you. The uh, the PCO in the documents that we reviewed also said that they wanted to review all documentation being requested by the committee. Were they, was PCO involved with uh, any of the redactions to the documents? Um, CBSA was non-compliant with a legal order of this committee to provide full documents. Um, and uh, we want to know if PCO was involved in uh, the restricting of the release of information um, that was lawfully requested by this standing committee. PCA makes redactions to its own documents. So what was PCO's interest then in reviewing all of the documentation before it was being submitted to the committee? Great. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Mr. Sousa, please go ahead. Interesting. What's also interesting is Diane Sylvain's uh, shout out member for one month. I uh, also held a higher position than Crown Prosecutor, there is no way a federal servant, federal public servant, loses their security clearance during an investigation unless Canada's security is at risk, public or being punished. That's that's our perspective on this as well, uh, Diane. So it's, uh, it's very peculiar. So anyway, here we come. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both witnesses for being here today. Um, Mr. Orgormi, have Bottler cooperated in discussions? Have you had any discussions with any of the principals? I've not spoken uh, personally with either of the principals. As I said, um, we invited them to provide any material that was pertinent um, to the investigation. Um, I have received uh, three letters from um, Ms. Dutt um, over the course of my time here. I have not spoken to her personally. Yeah, and, and so some of the concerns the committee has is the way it, per, it was proceeding uh, or it took shape, as you've rightly noted in your opening uh, remarks, um, that they didn't actually have a contract. Um, in fact, we're not really certain still as to what they were prepared to do or what was being asked of them, given that they were being proactive in their presentation to government and nor did GC strategies have a contract. I know that was some inference made to that. Can you explain what is developed here in your mind? Recognizing that 
there will be further information and uh, an internal investigation based on the information that I've seen. There was engagement with officials from CBSA, GC Strategies, Botler, Cordex and Dalian, getting involved in how, how the work of Botler would be brought to bear at CBSA. Yeah, you know, involved in these procurement practices that you you don't want to get involved in if if Cordex wants to subcontract to GC Strategies, which wants to subcontract to, to, to Botler and GC Strategies and Cordex steal a bunch of taxpayer money before it actually gets to the final the final people, which is Botler. Well, and the thing she said about how, um, you know, we requested the, the evidence from Bottler, however she phrased it, I mean, technically correct, but, and there's always a but, what had happened was they said to Bottler, give us all of your evidence, like everything, and then we'll pay you. Yeah, so that's they were, extortion. Yeah, I was going to say they were essentially extorting them so that Bottler could not go forward and Bottler could not blow the whistle. Because Butler are the true whistleblowers here. And they blew the whistle. And that's why these guys are sitting in committee today. Yeah, that's why this is all happening in the first place. Otherwise, none of this would have happened. There would be no RCMP investigation. There wouldn't have been a Globe and Mail article. There wouldn't have been a suspension of McDonald and Utano. None of this would have been happening. And that is what was presented to the RCMP. Am I not mistaken on that? That's what was given to them? The allegations by Bottler were passed to the RCMP. And none of that is anything to do with the Rife can. Oh, is my God. Again. I just want to make sure I've asked it 50 times before. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the answer. I can't hear. Why? Uh, Mr. Can Chair, I think I... Okay. Like, why? Answer the question. Don't nod. Answer the question. She doesn't want it on record. Yeah, I guess. That's exactly why. So, um, so RCMP is not investigating a rife can, but you are. You're taking initial steps. Is that correct? Am I? Am I? Is that? Is that what this committee is being apprised of? Investigation is looking into um, procurement practices at CBSA, um, following on. Frankly, the allegations that were provided by Bottler. So Bottler brought to the attention of, of myself some allegations that, if founded, would be extremely serious. Those were the basis for the launch of the investigation, and the investigation is, is pursuing the information, I assume, based on what it is seeing and hearing um, in terms of the people they talk to and the documents they obtain. Right. And so your disclosure and your engagement... Um, is to try to uncover as much as possible what has taken place. You're not trying to hide anything. You're actually trying to uncover more. I want to understand what happened, and I want to protect the integrity of the investigation and give it the time and space it needs to conclude. Mr. Osowski, can you position what occurred at that time given the urgency of the pandemic? Thanks for the creation of the app? Yes. Um, well, as I said in my opening remarks, um, it was an incredibly tense moment in history, certainly in the history of the Border Services Agency. Um, no one, I don't believe, before me had ever shut down the border before and still tried to make sure that commercial trade <clears throat> and essential food and medicine was coming across. And I was spending a lot of time with my American colleagues to make sure that the messaging was the same. They've got a different legal construct in terms of how airports work, but the land border was the primary concern given that's where most of the commercial trade comes through so, to Canada and back yeah, and no, forth. So, so it, it was a massive urgency, a massive border, uh, one of the largest, the largest, I guess, uh, in the world. And you had an issue of public safety uh, at the forefront. And now some are suggesting maybe there was too many or there were some shortcomings in the way things were pr processed. Can you explain what, did, were there any shortcomings in your, in your view? <laughs> the, the application development was processed? Yes. Um, and, and, and the procurement. 
Look, as I said in my opening remarks, we got the request and four days later, my team had put together mock-ups of what the application could look like. So we already had some uh, basic capabilities on this in the organization, but to do something as quickly and get things approved through an app store, both Android and Apple, was gonna require extra help. Um, the team had something ready to go uh, for a soft launch. I believe it was in the middle of April or just towards the end of April. Uh, and then it was fully launched. So it was a very, very tight time frame. Absolutely not normal in terms of the normal way we would procure any IT project or anything like this. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> Were we running at 150 miles an hour? Absolutely. Um, but this was a pandemic. People were dying. I think I remember at the, at the Sorry, time when we I shut the border, 100,000 people I have to had cut died. you off there, Mr. Osowski. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Sousa. Uh, Mr. Genoas, over to you, please. So, Ms. O'Gorman, two senior public servants involved in the Arrive Can affair, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Otano, provided highly detailed and critical testimony to this committee on November the 7th, 2023, about what happened in uh, Arrive Can. Um, they didn't toe the line. They were very critical of you directly, uh, as well as of Mr. Doan and indirectly, I think, of Minister Mendicino. Uh, my impression was that they did not intend to be uh, critical in particular, but they simply provided direct and forthright answers oh to God, direct questions. Come on. Uh, and we would welcome that from others as well. But in any event, after their testimony, immediately after their testimony, it seems that you, Im you ordered an investigation related to their conduct. Is that correct? You didn't order any investigation after their testimony? Their dismissal letters say that on November 27th, 2023, they were made aware of an investig uh, investigation by the Canadian Border Services Agency. Were they made aware of an investigation on November 27th, 2023? So in the course of conducting an investigation, at some point, individuals, if there are allegations against them, are formally informed of those allegations. Okay, so... so, so I think they were informed. To they were informed of an, that they were the subject of an investigation regarding serious allegations of misconduct, allegedly. They were informed of that on November 27th, suspiciously, just a few weeks after their testimony before this committee. So, are you are you claiming that that information was related to investigation that was actually launched prior to their testimony? Well, when, when was that investigation launched? There's one investigation that was launched in November of 2022. Okay. So, but then they were informed of what? The expansion of that investigation, a part of that investigation, or they were simply informed that they were the subject of particular complaints on November 27, 2023? My understanding is they were informed of the allegations against them. So there was the information... Were these the new al allegations or allegations that had been longstanding? So Butler AI presented allegations to the agency. The investigation that has been followed is consistent with any investigation undertaken by CBSA. Ma'am, I'd like, I'd like direct responses here. What I'm trying to understand is that a couple weeks after their appearance before this committee, they were informed of serious investigation into their own conduct. You're telling us that it just so happened that there were new re revelations related to an ongoing investigation. There's new revelations. The investigation but then why were they only told of this on November 27th? Were they, was, was information simply kept from them for a long time? Or, or, because you'd have to agree the timing is a little bit odd, isn't it? I don't agree with that. The investigation really? has been carried out consistent really? with our investigations. I have not spoken to the investigators. The process is such that when... Okay, okay ma'am. So, so pure, pure coincidence. They come on November 7th. They are very critical of you personally. And then, and then two weeks later, slightly more, they are told that they are under a cloud of investigation. And subsequently, you send a preliminary finding of fact to their bosses, which leads to them both being suspended without pay, all in a few months succession after their, uh, after their appearance at this testimony. 
they are uh, their their legal support is withdrawn as a result of a decision you made, which you claim is in keeping with Treasury Board guidelines. All of this in weeks and months immediately after they came and criticized you at this committee. And you're telling us that that had nothing, that that's pure coincidence. Is that what you're telling us? Is the suggestion that I'm interfering in the investigation? Because there is no information to support that. Ma'am, ma ma'am, I'm, I'm, pointing out, I'm pointing out the timeline. But here's what I would like you to do. I'd like you to provide the preliminary statement of fact that you provided to their superiors to this committee within 48 hours. Will you undertake to do that? I'll say two things. No, no, no. Will you provide that document? The preliminary statement of fact. Will you provide that document, ma'am? At a point in time. Will you and provide that document? Of my no, no, I'm, answer, I'm asking you a question. Act. And right now. You know, ma'am, ma you, you talk about your concern about the integrity of the investigation, but you have told this committee, you've chosen to publicly testify that you believe that Mr. Rutano and Mr. McDonald have behaved inappropriately. You have said that on the record at the same time as claiming you don't want to compromise the investigation. And you made the decision. Uh, to to uh, send those letters immediately after uh, they gave testimony at this committee critical of you. So if you won't answer my question, I hope the committee will agree with me to order the production of that preliminary statement of fact that you sent to the superiors of Mr. McDonald and Mr. Rutano, and I'd put it to the committee that we order the production of those documents within 48 hours. Okay. There's a lot there. Um... There's some good in there. There was some not so good in there. Um, let's start with the not so good. The not so good was genuous claiming that McDonald and Utano came to committee and tested testified forthrightly. Uh, sorry, genuous. I'm not on the same page as you as that. Well, genuous wasn't even on the same page as that during that committee meeting. Like, yeah. if we go back and watch the video, guaranteed, we'll see him getting pissed off and, and saying that they're not being forthright or forthcoming. And Well, remember, <laughs> this if the way he's going at O'Gorman now is the way he was going at McDonald and Utano. So if you're at committee and you're reacting to witnesses and you're like, oh, that's so forthright. You're not yelling at them and telling them that you don't believe them. But you know what I don't remember? I don't remember them going after Ritika and Amir in this manner. No, the liberals they did, not. did The liberals did. They, they, but the they conservatives did not. didn't. So they, they did not. Obviously, they believe them. So that's, that's the not so good. The good news, or the not good news, but the good that came out of this is that he has exposed a very curious timeline. And when he asked for these emails, so what he's asking specifically for is the emails that she sent to the deputy ministers advising them, uh, there's some not so good things that these guys have done. And that resulted them in being dismissed and their security clearances revoked. And she's uncomfortable about providing those emails. That's very interesting. I wonder if they implicate her. I wonder. Or I wonder if it's something just like so horrible. Like anything could be in there really. But it doesn't matter. It's not going to become public record. It's it's to the committee. Yeah. So the only trepidation would be what she said in that email. And maybe that's the problem. So, like, th this is the thing. We're, we're having to wade through the conservative strategy, which we completely don't agree with, and then look at some of the results that we're getting that, you know, we kind of agree with. This is the, this is the, the tough part about this, folks. So we're, we're doing our best um, because, the, like, we, we completely dis disagree with the, the approach that they're taking, despite the fact that they're getting some good results. Alice Avonlea with a $4 super chat. Not a single app worldwide worked. Um, well, it depends. I, there's a lot of uh, gaming apps that, uh, that definitely worked, but if you're talking anything related to COVID, yeah, not really. Um, so anyway, let's keep going here. That's not a question. That's that's to the chair. Okay, because Thanks. I think I'm out of time. And <laughs> we are, but I will ask colleagues, are we fine? Mr. Shawari, you want to respond on th to that? Yeah, the same the same comment as I did yesterday with uh, Mr. Gorjohn. If we can have it in writing, both official languages, I would appreciate that. And as usual, we always support the 
uh, any type of production of documents. Sorry, it's, it's, I, it's, I've, 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 I've stated it clearly. Je peux dire le même en français. I can say the same in French. We have interpretation services. Preliminary statement of fact that Ms. O'Gorman sent um, to the, the, um, the, the, the direct bosses of Mr. McDonald, Mr. Rutano, that led to their, um, that led to their suspension. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, requesting that the committee order yeah, the production I'm of those documents. I'm going to interrupt because um, we're out of time. We're going to try and get that translated and sent around, and perhaps we can address it in um, a bit later in the meeting. So we'll get the translation sent around to everyone. If you so just a couple of comments that have jumped out to me. Um, so Diane Sylvain, I actually believe that they are trapping today's witnesses to have them break down and say, no, they were liars. She will say, yes, I ordered a code red. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that would be nice, Diane, um, and it would make some for some great television. It it does look like, um, like everyone can see O'Gorman's body language. She's a lot less calm in her body language and now, more tense. yeah, than she was at the beginning. So this is this is wearing on her. Um, Where it's getting too close for comfort. Yeah, um, and uh, and and Fox made a great observation when. Um, when Sousa was asking for confirmation that, you know, none of the allegations that Butler made that went to the RCMP were about a ride cam, were they? And, and she refused to vocally answer. And I think she, it looked like she was almost like giving kind of a, like a visual signal to, to Sousa as she was kind of nodding. And Sousa was like, Sousa wasn't getting it. So he's like, I, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. Any, and she's just trying to nod. So she's not on record and saying, Yes. Whatever her yeah. answer is. Yeah, or no. So, anyway, all right, let's keep going. You could just provide and separate to uh, our clerk exactly what you're looking for so we can move forward on that. Uh, Mr. Clean Baines, water, Mr. we Chief. will <coughs> go ahead, Miss Atwood. Water? Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, Mr. Genuis, if you can just uh, lean back from the mic a little bit when you're speaking, it's just, it's hard on our ears, and I'm sure it's hard on interpretation. I just wanted to okay. put that out there. Thanks. We'll Thank pass you. it on. Mr. Baines, we'll try you again. Hopefully, uh, IT thinks they've got you fixed, so uh, we'll go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'm hoping everybody can hear me correctly now in translation and everything's okay. All good? So far, okay. so good. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I'm going to go to uh, um, Ms. O'Gorman. Uh, if you can, so we know arrive can is not being investigated. Um, as you're aware, the office of the auditor general has been working on a report of arrive can. And last she was here, she was disappointed that this matter had not been brought to her attention. Are you keeping in good, good contact with her office to make sure she has what she needs for her work? Yeah, that was my decision not to provide that to the auditor general at the time because the allegations related to another contract. Um, in hindsight, I recognize they were the same individuals and they were the same company. I probably ought to have informed them of that, including the caveats that we knew nothing further. We have appreciated the work with the Auditor General. Our teams have worked closely with them. I look forward to her report and I expect that she'll have some, some good recommendations. So you're referencing you said same individuals, same companies. Nice, Can you name them, please? <laughs> As they've been named here, um, GC Strategies uh, among the companies, and the individuals have already been named as well and, and are included in the email disclosure that uh, was in the package that I provided. So, so, uh, and... So procurement practices at CBSA is ultimately what we're looking at, what you're looking at. Um, so in light of what we've been hearing at committee these past months, do you have faith in your organization's ability overall to follow fair procurement practices? Like uh, you, everything that we've heard, um, you know, do you think the system is working um, and and your fault, your, the practices that you're trying to either improve or are you seeing some changes or you're bringing changes forward? Um, if you can maybe share some something on that. I think confidence in the people at CBSA, absolutely. 
CBSA does a lot of procurement of goods, of services. There are no specific concerns I have. Um, as regards contracting, staff augmentation, information technology, I have seen that you know in some cases uh, files were not complete. I've seen uh, engagements with um, vendors, with contractors that didn't involve procurement officials, unclear roles and responsibilities. That's what I'm looking to fix. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to Mr. Um, Ozowski. As you know, like part of our role here as members of OGO is to provide recommendations to government. Has your experience in this process, what you've witnessed here and your appearance here, uh, led questions. to any insights or recommendations that could improve uh, the procurement process? The question. Um, I would say I'm not privy to all of the information that certainly might come up from the Auditor General's work or the Procurement Ombudsman, but I'm certain that the agency would receive and the government would receive any recommendations to improve procurement um, gratefully. Okay, thank you. And um, in, you know, for the um, Federal information technology projects such as ArriveCan, Arrive and, and, and I think we've determined here, and from what you've mentioned earlier also, it was developed in record time um, and under dire circumstances and, and Gee, he's not reading ultimately questions at all, saved is he? the money uh, <laughs> when you were talking about how They're not to his left. Uh, the process <laughs> was in paper form and, and people filling out and, and, and the time saved and and... You know, do you feel that that was good value for taxpayers' dollars, the, the decision that was being made at that time? And so, as I mentioned, I don't think anyone could have predicted how many iterations and versions of the app there would be and all of the different tools that were built into it for things like vaccine certificates and holding people's health care information and personal information. Um, so it was something that started off as a very modest, simple application to take contact tracing information and pass that along and it grew into something incredibly sophisticated. Um, and so from that perspective and what I was talking about with Mr. Jawari, I think it was definitely more effective than a paper-based process. Uh, in retrospect, if this were to happen again, I'm sure there's lessons learned about how we would do this better. Um, but um, other than that, I, I don't have any comment. That is our time. Thanks, Mr. Baines. Thank you again for your flexibility. Uh, Mrs. Vignola for two and a half, please. Thank you, beaucoup. Thank you very much. Mr. Osowski, when did the pandemic start officially in Canada? That I, I would have to go back and check, but somewhere in, in the middle of March 2020. Okay. Yes. And in the emails that we received, uh, we... We're told about MOBO, I think that stands for Mobile Border, uh, as early as 2019. So is Mobile Border the uh, predecessor of ArriveCan? Was this project already underway before the pandemic? I don't recollect re re the, the details of the Mobile Border. I think that was actually for officers to use internally so that they had something as a mobile tool to use when they were going on tour buses. But I, I would have to go back and check with the agency on that one. Perhaps Ms. O'Gorman knows. Um, Madam O'Gorman, I have a question about language. Of course you do. I won't uh, repeat what I said before, but... Uh, Language C, C++, a specialist can be francophone from uh, um, the Quebec or another Canadian province and wouldn't be able to speak English perfectly. I know unilingual anglophones who still make mistakes in English. So why require English when your public servants are supposed to be bilingual and supposed to be able to communicate in both official languages with different um, contractors. There's a difference between bilingualism in applications and services given to Canadians and internal work for IT employees. According to my understanding, the working language that is most commonly used is English. 
Yeah, in the market, la, the, piecing, the working language is yes. English. And that is why when we wrote up that request, we made the knowledge of the English language a mandatory requirement. Most people who work within IT work in English. Concepts are discussed in English. Unfortunately... I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Johns, over to you, please. Uh, first, I want to give uh, Ms. O'Gorman just uh, a really quick chance to respond to uh, Mr. Genius's uh, question. She wasn't given a chance to reply. I wanted to know if she wanted to take that opportunity. I would just say that CBSA is conducting this investigation in the same way that it conducts all investigations. And that's very important, and it's important for the people of CBSA to see that, that we don't do things differently based on people's levels. And so the team is carrying out the investigation. There are established steps supported by jurisprudence. I'm not involved in talking to the investigators. I am certainly not directing anything related to that investigation. I receive updates. When I received a document, I shared it with the relevant deputy heads. So we are conducting that investigation in a way that is absolutely consistent with others. The public profile is certainly making it a challenge. We want to wrap it up quickly, and we want all those involved to um, participate in the investigation, meet with the investigators. Thank you for the opportunity to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to move a motion. It's a procedural motion from last uh, meeting um, and the motion reads and it's been circulated in both official languages that the clerk inform Vaughn Brennan that the committee sends for all records of communications from January 1st 2019 through the present between Vaughn Brennan and Riddick Dutt, Amir Morv and any other persons acting as or on behalf of Butler AI including communications by email call text message or any other method and that the information be provided to the clerk of the committee no later than 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 1st, 2024. Thanks. Mr. Johns, just to confirm, this is the one uh, you had uh, brought forward yesterday? Yes. Mr. Sousa, your hands up. Is it on this issue or? Yes, it is. Go just ahead, Mr. say that uh, we will support this motion. Great. Thanks very much. Consider it done, Mr. Johns. Thanks very much for your patience with that. And you've got about five seconds left, so. <laughs> I'd like to move another motion, Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, and uh, this this motion I'd like to speak to as well. Um, one, one, first... one second, Mr. Ba or Mr. Johns. Mr. Johns, you're basically out of time. Can you do it in your, we have one more round coming up. Could you do it in the last round, please? Okay, it's my understanding that uh, I can move motions in my time, and it suspends. You were actually you were actually out of time, but uh, I said the five seconds. But could you save it for the next round, please? Okay. We we will have time in the meeting, though. You don't have to worry. Okay. We're not going to finish right at three. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johns. Um, Mr. Please. A hard time reconciling the fact that you said you were at the Prime Minister's Department, but it wasn't about arrive can, but it was immediately before your appearance here. And when pressed in my questions to you, you said that you focus grouped your opening remarks to your um, your colleagues uh, who work in the Prime Minister's Department at that allegedly unrelated meeting. Um, <laughs> I find it hard to believe. I think Canadians would find that hard to believe. Yep. Um, who was there from the Prime Minister's office at that meeting? Yeah. We want to know. I've not met with anybody from the Prime Minister's office. My question was, who was at that meeting who works in the Prime Minister's office? If you mean the building, I was meeting with Privy Council office officials. Okay, so this is where it, it, it's, it's always funny. So A.D. Wellington, that's the address in Ottawa, is literally called the Prime Minister's office. So... Yeah, that building is called the Prime Minister's office. Yeah, it's it's a, and it's a real big misconception for I think almost everybody in Canada. So when normally you hear about somebody say the Prime Minister's office, you're thinking of a room with a desk 
Yeah, like the like uh, the Oval Office and, and a doorknob sitting in the chair, which yeah. is Justin Trudeau, <laughs> um, who Canadians have a question for him. What would you say you do here? Right. So, um, so the Prime Minister's office is not Justin Trudeau's office. It's the entire building, and there's meeting rooms and there's other offices. That's literally called the Prime Minister's office. Okay. Um, so this is where people got tripped up, uh, about this the entire time. So that's something just to really keep in mind when they're talking with this. And Aaron O'Gorman got tripped up with this. I wasn't in the prime minister's office. Yes, you technically were. You were in the building called the prime minister's office. So now she's going on to, um, talk about, you know, she was meeting with the Privy Council. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's even better. My question is very is very clear. You were at a meeting. It's in your calendar. You were acknowledged that you acknowledged that you were at the meeting. Was there anyone from the prime minister's office in attendance at that meeting? No. That, there was no one. Okay. So it was just PCO that you focus grouped your remarks for this committee with. The on, on page, I provided them uh, on page 180 of the emails that you provided to this committee. It talks about time management strategy for your appearance before this committee, and that PCO wanted to review all the documentation being requested by this committee. Something else that you you seem unaware of. So you're you're taking meetings immediately before and immediately after your appearance at this committee with the Prime Minister's Department PCO. They're reviewing all of the documentation that's coming from your office, your your department, which illegally. Uh, Ill illegally refused document production orders of this committee and you're telling us that that all of these meetings at PCO that are happening directly around your appearances at this committee are unrelated and and uh, though you, you do acknowledge that you uh, did circulate your opening remarks in advance but there was no discussion at this allegedly unrelated meeting. Is, do I understand that correctly? <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure where to begin to answer that so I've attended so meetings at be the best place to start absolutely. and that, that would be and that'd I, be a wonderful change. I have been absolutely honest and forthright with this committee. So the meeting you're asking about preceded my previous appearance at OGO. Is that the, the meeting? Chair, I'm not getting an answer. I'll, I'll give the rest of my time to my colleague. Mr. Gorman, given the extremely seriousness of this matter, with both the RCMP and the Auditor General now investigating this boondoggle of the Arrive Can Rocks. app procurement and the $54 million cost, you surely, as the President of the CBSA, would be keeping your minister, Dominic LeBlanc, the Minister of Public Safety, fully apprised of all developments. Is that correct? I informed the minister that I had received preliminary statements of fact that were of concern and that I was providing them uh -oh. to the deputy heads. Did you provide Mr. LeBlanc with a copy of those findings? No. Why not? I didn't think that he, uh, well, he didn't ask for it. How many meetings have you had with uh, Minister Le LeBlanc with respect to this investigation? We've had no meetings. I called him to inform him. How many I, calls have you had with him? On the, the one call. How many emails have you shared with Dominic LeBlanc? I sent him one email. Previous to Dominic LeBlanc was Marco Mendicino in that role as the Minister of Public Safety. Did you communicate with him as well? I called him to inform him of the allegations I received. And, and his response was? He was concerned with the nature of them. He expressed his expectation that I would shore up any gaps and... Um, informed me that I should keep him apprised if, uh, if there were any developments that he needed to be aware of. All your communications, were they via telephone or email? Um, I don't recall emailing the previous minister. I may have. Okay. If you have, you will, you will look back at your email, email chain with respect to both ministers, and you'll provide copies uh, to this committee within seven days. Is that okay? Now, last question. Lying before this committee has become a serious problem with a number of witnesses. It's almost a culture of lying and deceit. Although you've not been sworn to tell the truth, there's a presumption you are telling the truth when you appear at committee. Mr. McDonald, the now suspended public servant over the Arrive Can app, said that you lied, specifically targeting you for mistruths that you provided to committee 
uh, this past fall. Um, have you told the committee the truth and nothing but the truth today? I have told the committee the answers to the questions truthfully and to the best of my recollection. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Uh, we're going to uh, Miss Atwood now, please, for five. Okay, so we've been going for a little bit there. Um, so that was that was kind of an interesting lean in and lean out by Brock in terms of his questions. Um, a number of witnesses have lied. Yeah. So. Let's recall the witnesses. We have Christian Firth. We have Vaughn Brennan. We have Mindone. We have these two, Aaron O'Gorman and John Osowski. And we have, obviously, Ratika Dutt and Amir Morv. And what was that gentleman where they called him in and he brought a bunch of his staff instead? Oh, yeah. That, that was the PSPC crowd. Um, the... Public uh, public service uh, procuring uh, procurement people. Um, been a lot of people coming in, so I'm hoping that Brock is including Utano and McDonald in there without naming them. Um, but um, yeah, this is interesting. But. Um, you know, obviously gives her a veiled threat. Better not be lying. And uh, let's see where this goes. I thought I, I smelt parliamentary privilege there, but he didn't get into that. So maybe we'll we'll hear it later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have one quick question for Mr. Gorman, and then I'll be uh, directing most of my questions to Mr. Osowski. Um, I just have one piece that I'm confused about, about when the contract was cancelled with Butler. Was it due to issues with deliverables, or was it because of the misconduct allegations that it came forward? My understanding is uh, that it was cancelled because CBSA didn't feel that it had uh, it it had a need to continue with the contract. I don't know the details. Um, I don't know who made that decision, but that's my understanding. That's now the third reason that we've heard. So the first reason was presented by uh, Ratika Dutt and Amir, which is they were initially told that the project was on pause, and this is in the email evidence uh, in our videos. So they were waiting, and then they were told, and this was after they submitted the misconduct uh, report, they were just, they were cut off. And Cameron McDonald alleges that the reason why that the contract was canceled is because they, they, they tried to build a, a mansion when they were only asked to build a shed. Christian, if I remember correctly, didn't someone at some point in committee say that it was O'Gorman who made that decision? O'Gorman wasn't present. Okay, so I'm misremembering. Yeah, O'Gorman wasn't present until um, summer of 2022, and the and the contract was canceled in the fall of 2021. Um, but um, Christian Firth alleges that it was canceled due to substandard work. And now we're hearing it was just because the CBSA didn't want to proceed with the project. So I guess this is the fourth reason. Interesting. Like, so, so let's kind of get into this. So you don't know why that contract was canceled, but you know specifically what happened with Cameron McDonald and Tony Utano, which was the secondary part of this investigation. The first part was the fact that Butler's contract was, was canceled in the first place and there was all this misconduct around that. But you don't know the answer to that question. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Mr. Osowski, I don't know if you have any additional comment to that. 
Um, thank you for the question. No, in fact, I have no recollection of the contract or the task authorizations with Butler. The, the meeting I had with them where I got the demo uh, was my interaction with them, and there were some subsequent emails back and forth that we talked to about the last time I appeared, but that's it. I wasn't involved in the task authorizations. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to, to remind kind of our whole committee about the, the Treasury Board contracting policy. Um, so ideally, we want government contracting uh, to be conducted in a manner that will stand the test of public scrutiny in matters of prudence and probity, facilitate access, encourage competition, and reflect fairness in the spending of public funds. So in other words, fair, open, and transparent. Um, so Mr. Osowski, in your view, ha has scrutiny of the ArriveCAN procurement process or allegations of wrongdoing from Butler revealed any shortcomings of the federal integrity regime for public procurement? So I've retired and those investigations have started by both internally that Ms. O'Gorman is doing within the agency and then the procurement Robinson and the Auditor General. I'm sure that they will find things that could be improved in the process, but I think that should be caveated with what was happening at that particular point in time. Okay, thank you. So, so wrong things are allowed to be done because it was the pandemic. That's what I'm getting from that answer. That's such a shitty answer. It is. And the liberal is is essentially implying there's nothing wrong with procurement. Yeah, but the liberal stance is always throw money at it and see what happens. Exactly. So it doesn't matter. Thank you. Um, it, it's been argued at this committee and, and in the news uh, that staffing firms like GC Strategies bring no added value to government projects like the Arrive Can Act. They do not. Um, yet they received contracts worth millions of dollars for the specific project. Um can you explain, just in your point of view, what value, if any, staffing firms bring to government projects? I think you've heard testimony. Thank you for the question. I think you've heard testimony from several witnesses that getting qualified to access the government contracting regime is burdensome and complicated. It's not just about security screening. There's all kinds of things around intellectual property and access to buildings. Um, and it's very hard for small individual firms to do this on, on their own. So they go to these staffing agencies, these people that have specific skills and talent, um, and they make themselves available to these firms who do qualify to provide these services. Um, <clears throat> the government uses these, firm, these services regularly for unique skill sets. Um, Mr. Johns has been on record that public servants should be doing this. and. And I agree. I think, quite frankly, that <clears throat> if I had to have a, a recommendation around this, is that public servants should be doing what I would call run, which is maintaining the systems, patches, things like that. And the private sector should be used for bringing in innovation. Um, and that's where uh, there's probably a, a shift that I think would be beneficial. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Barrett alluded to a uh, you know, potential document called Lessons Learned, you know, Arrive Kid. Um, you know, just in, in your opinion, again, and based on your experience, uh, you know, even with this committee, um, what lessons has CBSA or should CBSA have learned from the Arrive Can project regarding the use of, of intermediaries like GC strategies or, or in process in general? You know, what lessons can we learn from this? So someone brought up a, uh, an interesting point um, in... Uh in here and it was Robert McFallon with his $10 super chat. This inquiry and the lawyers hired by government to hide their corruption will cost more than $54 million. So here's some context. Let's assume there's an average of around 12 MPs per every OGO committee meeting. Um, and um, they make a roughly, they make roughly $98 an hour. $98.50 an hour, roughly. So if there's 12 of them in the meeting and each meeting is approximately two hours long, then that's costing the Canadian taxpayer roughly $2,364 per meeting. And then if you look at all of the time that they're actually spending on this outside of committee and in other, in other meetings, and all of the investigation, you know, meetings as this goes along, I don't, I don't know if it's going to cost $54 million, but it's certainly going to cost in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer money. Now, these MPs are going to be paid the salary anyways, whether they're setting in com committee or whether they're doing well work elsewhere. 
Um, but what better things could they be spending their time on? Is yeah, the question. exactly. So Working with constituents or... So the argument is, is you're, sp you're paying them to spend their time on this versus spending their time on, you know, something that's actually productive for Canadians instead of having to chase down scandal after scandal. Well, and something else I wanted to point out, um, the MP was trying to make the argument that, oh, well, you know, it's... Uh, or sorry, not the MP, uh, the Osowski. former president, Aspowski, thank you, was trying to make the argument that, oh, it's very difficult for small businesses to navigate the government procurement system and, and this and that, and that's why these these agencies like GC Strategies will help them. That's garbage. Like, I know a guy who has a small business, and he he did a small project for the government and had to go into all that crap. And it was and, a pain. Yeah, it, it, I remember him telling me, oh my gosh, Fox, this is such a pain in the ass. But he did it. He did it on his own. He didn't get help. Like, if you own a, a business, you you kind of have the know-how on how to deal with contracts and and paperwork and that sort of thing. So you absolutely do not need GC strategies. Well, and why would you pay GC strategies that when you literally could just stand up, you know, a couple of recruiting people within the government and literally that's what they do. Now you're not paying all of that money. You're just paying salary. And after bringing in three different people, you've paid for that salary. So it's 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 just ridiculous. If you're looking at this from just a fiscal point of view. Dustin Gray with a $5 super chat. The Liberals bring nothing to this except for interference and possible witnesses. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you for the question. I mean, I think that uh, all of the investigations and audits that are being conducted right now will yield all kinds of lessons learned for the agency to take on hand, and I'm sure that they will. Great, thank you. Um, and, and lastly, uh, you know, is there anything that you would have done personally different uh, in this situation? In hindsight, yeah, right? We have the, you know, question. hindsight 2020. If we could look back and fix things, um, would you personally have done anything different as, as the acting president? You can tell she's a young MP. Yeah. And I'll question. start with a bit of a joke. I wish I'd never opened up the president of public health agency's email. Uh, asking for an app, um, but that that said, um, in, <laughs> um, that said, uh, look, we were moving very, very quickly. Everybody was making their best efforts to respond to the public health agency's requirements here to get this information, um, and uh, I, 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 I'm grateful and I'm very proud of what the agency did during that period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And back to Mr. Genuas, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Can I uh, ask uh, both of our witnesses just very briefly? Min Doan has said he's proud of the Arrive Can app. Um, is that your position as well? Are you are you are you both proud of the Arrive Can app? Yes, I'm. I'm very proud okay. of the app. And, I, and I'll, if I may, I would just expand on that a little bit. I don't have a huge amount of time. so you're your, Very quickly, the future of travel, and many countries are doing this, are all reliant on an application of this type of nature. Getting advanced information on the, people is critical. Okay. To yeah, yeah. I mean, my question was about the Arrive Can app specifically, but go ahead, uh, Ms. O'Gorman. Thank you for your response, Mr. Ososki. We continue to use it on a voluntary basis. About 300,000 travelers a month are using are, are it. You, are you proud of it? It worked. It performed. It did its job. It's just yes or no. Are you, are, you, are you proud of it? To, yes. Okay. Um, back to my previous line of questioning. So, so um, Ms. O'Gorman, um, I think you understand that when it comes to issues of conflict of interest, public servants has to avoid have to avoid the reality and the appearance of conflict of interest. Um, and I think a similar principle would apply to professional retaliation. That it's important to avoid the reality and the appearance of people facing professional retaliation for speaking to this committee. Um, uh, you know, by, by analogy, sometimes the horse's head is in the bed just because it's a convenient place to put it, but more often than not, it might be interpreted as a message. Nobody's making that connection except you, Genuous. Yeah. Um, like, here's the thing. Could it have been retaliation? Uh, yeah, but I don't have sympathy for the guys. 
This is the difference. They're not whistleblowers. They're, they're basically criminals. Because I think there's enough evidence to suggest that they are. Well, there's enough evidence to take their uh, security uh, clearances away. Right. So, you know, there it is. And the thing is, is if they didn't take their security clearance away and they were found to be, um, you know, breaking laws, then the criticism would have been, well, why didn't you take their security clearance away? So, you know, criticize for the right reasons. Ryan Paplinski with a 279 Super Chat. Her smirk and countenance does not impress me. No, no, nor us. She's, um, something's really off about Aaron O'Gorman. And something is very clueless about John Osowski. Yeah, he seems too jovial. Well, he just seems like, he just, he doesn't know anything. Oh, you know, I'm the president, but I don't know anything. Congrats. You don't know anything about anything that goes on in your organization. And we also have a super chat from Spawny420. Thank you very much. It's 420 somewhere. Oh, again. <laughs> <laughs> it's always 420 somewhere. Every live stream. Um, we, we had at this committee on November 7th, Mr. McDonald testifying that you and that CBSA lied about who was responsible for choosing GC strategies. 20 days after that, they received a letter saying that they were under investigation. And this was a new letter to them. Uh, And then about a month after that, they were advised that you had made the decision that their legal fees would not be covered. So you can tell us that that was not professional retaliation for their testimony before the committee. And, And whether it was purely intended as retaliation or not requires us to assess your motivation, something that's that's obviously difficult to do externally. But don't you think it, it obviously looks like retaliation and no. would likely have the effect of chilling public servants who would otherwise be interested in and willing to come before this committee and give <coughs> honest, frank testimony? No. The no, fact I think what that you're doing is damaging so sh- Yeah. I think what Genuous is doing with this line of questioning and this narrative that these, these two guys, McDonald and Newton, are whistleblowers is, is really harming other whistleblowers, like proper whistleblowers yeah because because remember the implications of this the implications that they're saying that we believe everything that mcdonald and Newton are saying are basically saying we don't believe butler that's what they're saying but not only that butler blew the whistle on mcdonald and Newton. they said they're caught up in this right so if you have another case with other whistleblowers saying oh you know my supervisors or this person that i'm working with is doing something wrong, I need to blow the whistle. Maybe they won't now because they're going to be worried about going to committee and then the people that they're accusing being hailed as whistleblowers instead. Well, and then being used as a political pawn. Yeah, and that's not right. And that's the issue here. You know... You know, like this This may, this may lead... Let, let's just, you know, best case scenario... This may lead to, you know, this this big scandal. They end up connecting it to a minister and, you know, the government falls because they've lost the confidence of the house. Okay, fine. I hope it was worth it because what you would have done at that point is dissuaded any, as Fox said, any external whistleblower from coming forward because y- you would have you would have trampled Butler in the dirt as the original whistleblowers for exposing all of this. Well, here's how I see it, just from an outsider's perspective or or commentator's perspective, is that you get these two guys come to committee, McDonald and Utano, and they give horrible testimony and everybody's really critical of them. And then all of a sudden, they're being told that they're victims. How does that look? What is the perception of that? You know, we got this Globe and Mail article on Tuesday that said these guys are on unpaid leave and their security clearances have been revoked. All of us were like, hallelujah, finally, these guys are being held accountable for what they did. And then the conservatives are like, these guys are victims. You know, they were they were lashed out against and this and that. That gives a horrible public perception. Yeah, like like. 
Like the reaction is just WTF. To me, it's not worth whatever whatever they're chasing. Like whatever the conservatives are trying to uncover with this tactic, it's not worth it to me. So Dan Karen's keep saying wait for it, so we'll keep waiting. All right. We'll take your advice. Dan knows something we don't because we haven't seen this yet. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's become glaringly obvious we haven't seen this. Yeah. Uh, Johnny O, a member for two months, NP supporter. They're proud of something that put innocent people in prison hotels. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's the problem here. Oh, it worked. Uh, it certainly did not. It certainly did not. Like, come on. Shortly after their testimony, you made the decision to pull their the support for their legal fees and that they received a letter saying they were under investigation, which led them to be suspended from their jobs without pay. Does that not have the appearance, at least, of professional retaliation against them and their careers as a result of testimony they gave to the Government Operations Committee? Yeah. Sorry, let me just interrupt. Mr. Sousa, do you have a point of order? Yeah, if Mr. Jennings could just sort of step back a bit. It's, it's hard to... It's very staticky uh, when he speaks so close to the mic. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Mr. John. Or go ahead. Um, uh, my question was to the witness. Go ahead. I'm not retaliating against anybody. I'm trying to find out what happened. Do, do, <laughs> do you think it looks like retaliation, that these, these events happen to occur, uh, that had severe negative implications for their career immediately following their testimony before this committee? that all decisions that were taken were taken by the accountable people. You reference um, legal I'm, I'm confident that you're, you're not answering the questions, though. Uh, I, 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 this isn't my first committee hearing, and this isn't your first committee hearing. My question was, would you not agree that this looks like a, a scheme to retaliate and punish public servants who were critical of you, your leadership, and others within CBSA? that it is and I'm telling you that I'm not retaliating against anybody it, it, it I don't really believe you but in any event it sure looks that way can, can you provide some other explanation as to why immediately after they came to this committee they said they were threatened by other public servants and that nothing was done on that they said that you and others had lied to this committee and then you're the one who gets to decide whether or not the department covers their legal fees. And, and you, perhaps unsurprisingly, make the decision to pull their legal fees. Doesn't that look like you made a decision to punish people that criticized you at a parliamentary committee? I approved their legal fees for their first appearance. I received no request. Yes, I have no you, you, you approved their legal fees before they appeared. And they're coming back to this committee. I'll give it to you in a moment. They came to this committee, they were supported with their legal fees before they appeared, but after you heard what they said, you pulled their, their support, and next time they come before this committee, they will not have the support for their legal fees as a result of a decision you made. Because now you know what they're going to say. Is that not the case, ma'am? No. They have not asked for legal support for their appearance, and they have been encouraged to make that request so that I can render an answer for that. They have not asked for legal fees for their appearance before this committee coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going now to Mr. back to Mr. Baines, please. Interesting. Um, this is so convoluted because, again, trying to navigate past the, the strategy, um, what was interesting is... This is the, the, the piece to pick up on. What Genuis didn't say was that she was retaliating. What he did say was, it sounds like that's retaliation. And then she said, well, you know, that's not what I'm doing. So the question that I have is, is Genuis insinuating that it was retaliation by people above the CBSA. Maybe. Um, the trouble is, it's like she's not even answering questions directly, which is also a problem. So something's going on with her. And um, 
I also find it interesting that, you know, Jenner is like, well, you, you know, you, so you pulled their, their legal fees. I think what she's trying to say is I didn't pull their legal fees. They haven't submitted any new ones. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me as well. So it'll be very interesting if they come back to the committee and then they uh, then they submit for legal fees and if she approves that. Well, and then they're going to say, oh, you know, taxpayer money paid for these legal fees. Which, oh. pff, yeah, that's an issue. Like, they shouldn't have been paying for the legal fees to start with. But, you know, whatever. Because they're... Yeah, this is so convoluted. It's just such a mess, yeah. It is completely, completely messed up. Um, but one thing's for sure, she is very, very rattled. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I was ceding my time to uh, Ms. Atwin. Oh, no. Okay, sure. <laughs> um well, I mean, we've we've talked a lot. Um, we've kind of gone in circles a little bit on some of these questions today. Um, but I really, I, I want to thank our witnesses um, for your patience, uh, your tenacity. Um, and I mean, it, it hasn't been easy. Um, and I, I'd like to, to caution um, also well, some of our, our colleagues uh, in the committee butts. for some of the harshness of their words and insinuations. Um, we really need to be careful about how we how we conduct ourselves. And we need to treat our witnesses uh, with respect because they've given their time to come here today. A liberal... <laughs> liberal advising people and giving advice on how to conduct themselves yeah and whom i should give respect to hard pass yeah yeah um yeah and again i think each of us wants to get to the bottom of this and i think that's what what the the point is what we're trying to do and i think it can be done in a manner um that's becoming of, of well it certainly can be done in a manner when um, you're not asking any so questions saying that, related to it um miss ogram and i i asked mr Osowski, you know if, if he would have done anything different during that experience um but you know yeah, like this where you're you're here in the seat now you're in this important role um you've, you've already initiated some She's key so changes around procurement moving forward which, which i think is great are there any other lessons you can take away from this <sighs> <laughs> The exasperation. <laughs> oh my goodness! And this is a this is a great frame to pause it on too. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> She's like, "Are you effing kidding me?" <laughs> she has been through like, yeah, uh, this like has this been a tiring day. <laughs> this MP is acting like a school teacher now, little Johnny. Are there any lessons that you can learn from this? Yeah, she's terrible. Terrible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna look this lady up and just see you know like what like how old are you? She Jessica looks Atwin. like a millennial. Jessica Atwin, born in '87. Yeah, millennial. There you go. That explains everything. Leftist millennial. I think every day, the people of CBSA are doing outstanding work. I'm very concerned about the public nature of this investigation. I ask myself whether anything could have been done. It was duly provided to the professional standards people who have undertaken investigation. I've assured myself that the process is consistent with any investigations they would undertake in the CBSA. I need the people of the agency to have confidence in these processes. That is my absolute preoccupation. We have discussions about accountability, about values and ethics. The people of CBSA are doing excellent work and it's an organization of accountability. People in CBSA, frontline officers take decisions every day and they have those decisions tested in court. It's an organization that understands accountability. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what happened. I'm impatient to do so. And I regret that the people involved have to have the added stress of the public aspect of this. I look forward to a final investigation. And as I've said, I will take any additional um, actions that, uh, that support any of the findings of that. Thank you. Um, and do you have any kind of general comments just as a as a witness, um, as, as someone appearing before a parliamentary committee like this? Um, how has your experience been? What? We're all trying to get to the bottom of this, but I'm going to ask you, do you like coming to committee? 
Like, come oh, on. Oh, man. Like, look. Our tax dollars at work, folks. If this is your MP... Uh, Vote for somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want to send Morble after her. You will be destroyed! Like, I really, really do. Because this... This is ridiculous. This is so demeaning. Like, not... Okay, not only to the people in that committee, but it's demeaning to the rest of us as Canadians that she's choosing her to use her time as, like... A sorority girl. Yeah. No, no like, like uh, what do you call it? Uh, a, an interview, like a, an exit interview almost. Like, just, how is working here? Do you want to go for coffee leaving? after? Yeah. Tell me about your feelings. It's just... Yeah, immediately before that, we're all trying to get to the bottom of this investigative. Well, well, maybe everybody, everybody except me. I, I just, I, I just, I need a new girlfriend. Can you be my girlfriend? Thank you very much. That'd be great. It's difficult to be um, accused of lying uh, in a general sense. Um, as I said, I have provided truthful testimony. I have provided and continue to provide the materials that were requested. And I stand ready to continue answering questions. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Osowski, now that you're, again, kind of on the other side of things, um, you know, I think about um, what lessons for us that you'd really like us to learn. I, I kind of asked this question, but as far as, as recommendations moving forward, we've got a couple of reports we're looking forward to. We've got the Auditor General's report. Um, there's a look into uh, procurement processes more more broadly as far as the, the Ombuds report. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, for us, what's the main takeaway? What what do you want us to have, you know, oh, taken from these, these few months of discussions, you know what? Um, kind of the back and forth exchanges? What, what can we do better? Uh, you know what? This plays directly into the Conservatives' hands that now they can point and go, see these ridiculous ridiculous questions that the liberals were asking look at this why aren't they asking the hard questions why aren't they trying to get to the bottom of this for canadians why are they asking questions that like your shrink would ask you how do you feel well remember there is zero zero comments zero questions by literally any of the liberals regarding cameron mcdonald and Nutano being fired sorry not fired removed the question is, is, like, why aren't there questions of, you know, does that concern you that, uh, that you know, the, these, these you know, claims has been substantiated? Like, it's literally their government. They should be concerned as all heck. But there's no mention of it. It seems like they're having a party that these guys are now suspended. This is just beyond ridiculous. So you have the concert. So you have the liberals having a party that these guys have, have been suspended, and then you have the conservatives that are taking the the aspect that these guys are are, are hero lauded whistleblowers, you know, that are victims and should be, you know, should should have pity taken upon them because they were professionally reprimanded to the point where they're probably going to lose their jobs and, you know, as a road probably in jail. Well, that's another point. They're going to lose their jobs if they end up in jail. So there you go. So it's just very strange. Uh, Dandeman, nine six six five dollar super chat. If you're from Fredericton, New Brunswick, really, when you're in the election, both, uh, please, for the love of God, give her the boot. My God, my ears bleed. Yes, I completely agree. And we also have a five dollar super chat from Don Wickenden. It says, "How does this twit?" get to just own the committee, bypass the chair, and now openly eat feet at the same time? Great question. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, and, and gets and gets time just, you know, seated to her. It's ridiculous. Um, as committee members and as parliamentarians. The question, I think the only thing I would offer is that <clears throat> um, to, to uh, my colleague Aaron's point is that these processes um, take time um, and that the committee is hungry for all kinds of answers and information and I, I totally understand that. But I think there's a, an appropriate balance to be struck in terms of ensuring um, a fair process for all the people involved. And so I think there's, um, there's some thought that could be given to that in terms of uh, the demands of information versus the due process that needs to unfold. 
Thank you. Um, and, and Ms. O'Gorman, you alluded to the idea that we need to have, you know, faith in disciplinary processes as well. We need to be assured, each of us, um, that if there's wrongdoing, that there will be, um, you know, you'll have to you have to meet, uh, you know, the the decisions and you'll have to, to feel the repercussions of that. Um, and I have faith that that's going to happen. And I'm just wondering, you know, do you have faith that that will happen as well? That will happen. Great. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Just on time. Thanks very much, uh, Mrs. Vignola, for your final two and a half. Merci. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, before we get into that, thank goodness that's over. Um, Cassie with a 279 Super Chat. Why does she remind me of Carrie Martin? Uh, that's a great, great question. Um, she just reminds me of nails on a chalkboard, to be honest. Um, and... and just the hypocritical implication. Oh, well, you know, we should all have confidence in the di disciplinary processes. Um, I think your boss, Justin Trudeau, has escaped, you know, so much discipline that nobody has confidence in your government disciplinary processes. We only have confidence in the Canadian process of, of getting his ass out. Your chair. First of all, I'd like to um, complete the comment I was making earlier. When in the language requirement, there is a requirement to be Anglophone and the option to be a Francophone, it sends a message. The message sent to Franco-Canadians and Quebecers who are specialized in this field is that regardless of their skills and capacity in the field, it will never be enough. And that Canada is willing to miss out on, on someone that could be a specialist in their field because they have to speak English. And it's not just in technology. There's, there's a requirement for English in so many fields. The message is that Canada is willing to pass on this, this specialist in their field because they simply don't speak, quote unquote, the right language. That's the message this government has been sending in so many fields. So, it should be taken into account. There are Spanish specialists, Japanese specialists, all of whom don't speak English, who work in technology and IT at very high levels. So that's my comment. I just think it should be taken into account. Now, here's my question. Glad that's your priority. Do the same teams usually work with the same vendors? For instance, ArriveCAN and Butler AI. Is this standard practice? given the nature of these contracts? I don't know if I can give you a definitive answer. It has to do with perception. Um, microphone was often audible. Now, talking about lawyers, given that Mr. Itanu and Mr. McDonald no longer work for CBSA, that they've moved on to two other organizations. Why are you still in charge of authorizing the payment of their lawyer fees? Because the case is linked to activities that took place while they were working for the agency. And so these people's lawyers have sent, let, have they sent letters to other witnesses in this case telling them to speak up or to not talk without, is it possible that it could have happened? If it did, I have not been informed. Go ahead, please. Sure, thank you very much. So I'm gonna get back to the opportunity to table that motion. Uh, I put uh, three motions on notice. Um, the first motion I'd like to move uh, is, uh, and I'd like a chance to speak to that motion and, and it's timely today, given that the SIBA loan extension uh, ends today. Uh, so this motion, I'm going to read it into the record, given that 900,000 small businesses in Canada risk closing because of the government's unwillingness to extend the SIBA repayment deadline, that the committee report the following to the House within the first five sitting days following the ad ad adoption go, of this motion, to do with this that it is in the opinion of the committee that the government should extend the loan uh, repayment period including the deadline for accessing partial loan forgiveness for at least another year to ensure small businesses can continue supporting local economies 
and good paying jobs. Oh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could speak to the motion now. Yep, go ahead. I've started so a I, I speaking think, list. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, Mr. Chair, this is the deadline. Uh, it is today that, you know, we know that there's 200,000 loans at uh, businesses that CFIBs identified that just can't pay the loan, that won't be able to meet the deadline today. These are businesses that close their doors to protect public health. And you've heard me at the committee cite that the PBO uh, costed out what the one-year extension would cost, and it's actually roughly about 4.2% um, uh, decrease of outsourcing costs to the highly paid consulting firms that are getting contracts with the government. Um, this is outsourcing that has doubled under the Conservative government when they were in power and gone up fourfold under the Liberal government. So, Mr. S uh, Mr. Chair, like 4.2% decrease in outsourcing would cover the cost of the extension. Small businesses and their workers are the backbone of the Canadian an economy. They provide good... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk over it. Good idea. There you go. Oh, my gosh. This committee meeting is such a hot mess. It's like everybody talking about everything, you know, this, this liberal lady asking, uh, asking interview questions. John's talking about whatever he's talking about right now. We got Vignola talking about, uh, you know, oh, why isn't, why isn't there stuff in French? Like, oh my gosh, guys, focus, focus. And JD, if you're uh, kind of curious as to what uh, Barnaby was saying to you, uh, he's uh, role-playing as a uh, bartender and, uh, um, <laughs> he's saying that you are 34 million uh, in line, so you got a long way to, uh, to wait for a uh, uh, for another drink. I imagine is Barney be the uh, bartender tonight, or is he the Stu Barnes who's serving both? drinks? Why yeah. Not both? <laughs> Uh, Mr. G with a 699 super chat. When you want 50% equality and only 20% elected, that's what you get. That's exactly what you get. Referring to Vignola in the language. Will Kowalchuk with a $15 super chat. I would like to thank Northern Perspective for this eye opening stream. I know there is a plane for all this, but I am lost. And, uh, and how do you feel? Well, we're, um, we'll get into it really like good at the end but um i'm not impressed yeah like i said this committee is a hot mess yeah uh gary michaela is a uh, giving us a five dollar super chat just to thank you for untwisting the government double speak love your show you guys are the best thank you very very much for that is he still going yep oh my god and goodness. they plan to borrow which is extremely costly costly to them they say one third they don't have the money and can't secure a loan Extending the deadline will give these businesses one more year to keep reducing their print. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that everyone appreciates this motion being written now. Sorry. If the Liberals keep refusing to extend the deadline with the forbi forgivable uh, portion intact, these businesses will have to find even more money to spend on interest. And that will force them to make hard choices that could put their workers' jobs at risk. And while the Liberals have been outright refusing this extension, the Conservatives have been absolutely silent. And it seems like they both don't want to admit the truth out loud, that they don't want to support small businesses right now, but have no problem helping rich corporations get off the hook. Oh, and Instead, this is what the Jagmeet was going on about on Twitter. To the, allow them to spend the money they need on scaling up, keeping their workers employed, and this, making okay, investments that benefit their local economies. This isn't a motion for small businesses. We this can't isn't fully election calculate pitch. the sure economic is. and social benefits this is of garbage. these businesses you remaining know, actually, open. Fox, that's a really putting, good point. Why do you think he's reading it now during the Arrive Can testimony? Because people are we've watching got it. over 900 people watching right now. So people are watching it. People are watching. This is trash. I hate when they do garbage like this. Grandstand. Yeah. See, this could have been done at the end. Yep, where we could have skipped it. See, John's, you know, you ask some good questions and then you do crap like this. What would you say? You do here. <laughs> I just came up with that today, and I'm just like, I, I'm, yeah, I, I want to use it. <laughs> he's, he's got a few videos on his clipboard there. One's of Genuous, and he's making me not want to use it right yeah, now. Yeah, no, I'm not too happy with Genuous right now. And I appreciate um, the NDP putting forward a motion that reaffirms and describes the SEBA program and the importance by which this was brought forward to help hundreds of thousands of businesses keep afloat during a tremendous time of uncertainty during the pandemic. 
And I have a few amendments that I've already discussed with Mr. Johns, and I'd like to submit them to the clerk, and I'll submit it both in English and in French. Um, and I would prefer to move them in a block, but we're prepared to move them separately as well. Brooks, my first this amendment, is garbage. This is raw sewage. Yeah, I agree. This is called filibustering, yeah, everybody. Yeah, it sure is. No wonder this committee went on for, like, what was it, an extra half hour? Oh, all right. We'll go to the chat while these guys are yakking back and forth. What's going on with you guys tonight? Let us know. Economic <laughs> aftershocks. Tony Pettifus with a 699 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Thanks for all you do, Cypher, Fox, and Barnaby. You're completely welcome. Completely welcome. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is a liberal NDP filibuster going on right here. Notice that uh, Mr. Souza already discussed all of the amendments that he wants to uh, pre present to uh, to committee in this. And, you know, he's going through all of them. And that the committee call for a government response uh, to his report. Uh, my we third got amendment. Android. First time catching you two live. Loving the content. Excellent. Welcome. We usually do live streams on Sundays. Um, Sundays at 930 Eastern. Um, this coming Sunday, we're thinking, unless something very interesting pops up, we're thinking we're just going to do like a Q&A where you guys can come on in and ask us some questions and just have a nice laid back chat. Yeah. And ask us almost anything. Um, and uh, and there you can go. Uh, oh, we're going to we're, we're going to wait. We're, we're just. We're we're listening to the elevator music as we get by here, Dan uh, Dan Karen. So don't worry about it. We're not going anywhere. Um, I'm wondering if I could even skip past this stuff. Yeah. Oh, is he done? Please tell me he's done. Thank you, Chair. So so I'm going to address a, a couple things that are are happening. Yeah. So uh, first of all, we have this. Uh, this kind of manufactured disagreement between uh, two coalition partners here. Uh, if if these issues around small business are, are priorities for the NDP, uh, they could have, they should have uh, put these things forward as part of their their coalition deal. Um, and uh, it would it would have, it would be a welcome change if this government uh, started paying attention to the concerns of small businesses because we know oh, still going on about that. that small businesses have been treated absolutely brutally under this government. Uh, the the disdain this government has shown going back to calling small businesses tax cheats, the prime minister's own words, in fact, suggesting that many small businesses are simply a um, his words, of course, he, he claimed that, that they are in many cases wealthy Canadians trying to avoid taxes. Uh, he knows a thing or two about wealthy Canadians trying to avoid taxes normally, but in this case, he's, of course, <laughs> dead wrong. Small businesses are, are the lifeblood of our economy, and small businesses, taxpayers, uh, Canadians of, of all backgrounds, uh, have, have experienced the, um, the pain associated with the radical economic agenda of the NDP uh, liberal liberal government. Uh, I, of course, have a great deal to say on, on that subject, but uh, I, would, I would also add that um, the proposal from Mr. Souza to, um, to require a government response to this report um, it, it is not about actually getting a government response. It's about inserting a 120-day delay before uh, this issue can be considered by the House in a concurrence motion, which, which Mr. <coughs> Souza or whoever made this recommendation to him, of course, knows. Uh, so, so the idea that there's some urgency, you know, that, that we just, we have to pass this today. Well, it, this committee voting on this motion today is, is not going to impact the, um, the timeline because, because look, if, if the government was going to extend it, the government would need to, to extend it. Uh, the government has, um, it, by all indication, chosen not to do it. Uh, this is not a government that listens to small business. Um, the, the, the best we could hope for through this process would be that this would be reported to the House. Uh, the subsequent effect of it being reported to the House uh, would, 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 it wouldn't be reported to the House until sub substantially after uh, the deadline. And then certainly if Mr. Souza is successful with his amendment, uh, the, the, the earliest time the House could pronounce itself on this matter uh, would, be, would be months and months from now. Um, and uh, this is being done at a time that, that has limited, unfortunately, our ability to ask critical questions uh, to very senior public servants uh, who are, needless to say, under a, under a cloud of, of significant suspicion. I'm, I'm happy to debate 
uh, this government's economic agenda and how, how uh, poorly they've treated small businesses. Uh, but we have an urgent matter uh, related to the, the Arrive scam situation. Uh, an urgent matter uh, that, that follows not only $54 million spent on an app and, uh, and RCMP investigating some of the related contractors, uh, uh, middlemen receiving large amounts of money for no work. Uh, but senior public servants uh, accusing each other of lying and of um, and, uh, um, and apparent retaliation for testimony given at parliamentary, uh, parliamentary committees. Um, in that vein, Chair, I did want to just identify the fact that I think it is time as part of these hearings that we hear from, uh, from ministers. Um, I know I can't move a motion and I don't think you need a motion for that, but I think uh, significant questions have been raised uh, in this discussion among public servants that uh, need to be answered by ministers. So I hope, uh, I hope you, would, um, ha you would choose it at some point soon to invite the Minister of, of Public Safety, the Minister of Treasury Board, or the Minister for Procurement uh, to appear before the committee and help us uh, unravel some of the contradictions we've heard among senior public servants and also find out to what extent they have been privy uh, to the conversations around ArriveCan, but also some of the retaliatory actions taken against, uh, against uh, public servants. I also hope at some point we could also hear from the minister at the time, uh, Mr. Mendicino. Is Chair, that the um, end game? And I to get the ministers in? Yeah, is, yes. is that th what this whole play by the conservatives with the victimhood yes. and the whistleblower? Yes. That's garbage. That's hot garbage. They That's, could have asked for the ministers. They could have requested the ministers prior. Like, yeah, but the ministers can decline. The ministers don't have to come. Doesn't matter. Like, they, oh, I don't they disagree. They didn't need to do it in this manner. I don't disagree. The, this, the, the, the whole play is to put pressure on the ministers and to, uh, and cause such a ruckus that, um, that the ministers have to come and testify. That's, that's the play. And it's a, uh, it's not a, a, a great game that they're playing. Uh, Don Wickenden with a five dollar super chat. My mousy is literally wondering if this clown's headphones are making his uh, his lying face red, like it's clamped to his head. <laughs> yeah, that could be. Uh, Spawny four twenty four twenty. It's still four twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, thank Love you. It. And we also have a comment from Norm Nicholson. It says, "Cipher, please speak to us all in Chihuahua ease." <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> After after this stream, I don't know if I can do that, Norm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it picks up. Dan, I'm I'm you're 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 keeping me alive. He says it's not over. Keep watching. <laughs> and so I can't recall if we read this one. It's from Tony Petipas. It says, Thanks for all you do, Cypher, Fox, and Barnaby. Yes, I did get that one. Awesome. You got it twice then. <laughs> I also um I've been reflecting on this over the course of this Dan's hearing. And also line. Uh, <laughs> related to the issues around retaliation Dan, you better against, not be lying to me. Um, against public servants, I would like to raise a question of, of privilege. Uh, and this question of, of privilege, um, so you can, you can advise me on the appropriate procedure around this chair. Um, but my view is that um, it is a critical privilege of committees and of parliamentarians to be able to uh, call witnesses, hear from witnesses, and for those witnesses to be able to present their information uh, without being subject to retaliation and intimidation. When witnesses are subject to retaliation and intimidation, it limits the rights and privileges of committees because it constrains our ability to actually hear and receive accurate and truthful testimony. And it's clear to me uh, from the series of events we have seen that um, if not direct intentional retaliation, there certainly is a strong appearance of retaliation, which will cast a chill on the ability of this committee to hear from public servants. We want to be able to have public servants come before the committee and simply tell us what they're, what they're hearing. And I think now that is going to be, um, be constrained as a result of the fact that senior public servants have retaliated against those that have given direct and frank, frank testimony. So I think this is a matter that does touch on privilege of members of parliament. So I wanted to put that on the record as well. Um, so thank, thank you, uh, Mr. General, Mr. Johns, really quick, please. Um, okay, so before I get into privilege, um, thank you very much to Peter Giroux. 
for the five dollar super chat fox cypher decoding double talk asking them if they want a bowl of ice cream they'll give a double talk answer sad when you take the bowl away yeah that's pretty much it uh it's, it's a really good uh, uh way to put it um so let me just ask the chat um do um does the chat want me to explain what parliamentary privilege is if you do please press a one um if you have watched this enough and you understand what parliamentary privilege is please press two um so it'll take a couple of seconds for that to get to everybody but um again just one if you want an explanation of parliamentary privilege two if you don't need a uh, uh definition of a parliamentary privilege just want to make sure that uh, everyone is uh is clear on what this is so okay so i don't see uh oh, i see one two two twos majority ones okay perfect so um parliamentary privilege um it's as with all con government terms it is a very confusing sounding term because parliamentary privilege sounds like well they have a privilege it's a privilege to do something not really so what parliamentary privilege is basically is their ability to do their job as a member of parliament unimpeded and unobstructed. If something is a question of privilege, what that means, it is preventing them from executing their duties. So what Genuus is referring to is he's saying that if people are being dissuaded from testifying truthfully at committee then everyone in that room has is having their parliamentary privilege affected and violated because they're not able to effectively do their job if people are you know being felt pressured not to, to to be truthful the other example that i will point to that is a real example is um uh michael um oh my goodness why don't I remember his name? The the um, I'll, I'll remember it later. Uh, the most respected uh, conservative MP in the House. Um, he was he was interfered with by China. His family was threatened, harassed, and that was a direct result of how he voted um, in um, in a piece of legislation that went through the House. So. China retaliated against him. And that is a question of privilege because if if a foreign entity is literally threatening your family because of how you're voting in the house, then that is going to impede your ability to do your job properly. Michael Chong, thank you very much. Uh, what a day. So that is a question of privilege. Same thing with, uh, with Aaron O'Toole because he was interfered with. And, uh, uh, and and so this is what privilege actually means. It's their ability to do their job. So if people are lying to you, not giving you correct information, you can't then take that information and do something appropriate with it as an MP. So it's a question of privilege. So, um, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. I think if Mr. Genius is fine, I'm fine. Thanks. Um, Mr. Genuis has raised a uh, question of privilege. Privilege uh, issues have to take precedence, and unfortunately it does adjourn the debate. We will oh. take up this uh, oh, motion. Morning, Let me... <laughs> wow. What a play by Genuis. Okay, he wasn't serious about that. That's funny. All right, so we're paying, we're playing parliamentary chess now, everybody. Um, so um, I forgot about that. So the issue was is the so the NDP raised this motion, and that introduced debate. So that's why Souza was able to talk, and then it went over to the Conservatives to be able to talk, which Jenny was talked to. Uh, talk to that a bit and then he raised a motion of privilege and whenever you raise a motion of privilege it immediately adjourns any debate that's on the floor 
So what ended up happening is he completely squashed the NDP motion and, and the debate that actually followed that. So it cancels the debate that Gore John started in terms of his filibuster. Thank God for that. So he used a, a, a parliamentary process in his toolbox to actually stop the filibuster right then and there because he raised a, a question of privilege. Very clever, which is why Kelly is kind of smiling here. So, um, very smart, very smart. Finish. We will take up this motion um, on the uh, amendment by Mr. Souza at our next meeting. But there privilege uh, issues have to take precedence. Sure, just, just, just point of order. I mean, if if the matter of privilege is dealt with, then we we, yeah, we can get back. Then we to go yes. back to it. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, this is. Yeah. Yeah. We will resume. Well, hopefully. Yeah, we'll resume it after on uh, Mr. Seuss's amendments after we've dealt with the issue of privilege, which has to take precedence. Like and, and now this allows the chair to reschedule when that debate is happening. Okay, so it, it, it really, you really have to know your parliamentary processes here or else you're going to get outplayed by the other side. It's constant chess. Let me just finish Mr. Johns and I will go to you. But Mr. Uh, Genovese has raised the question of privilege, House of Commons procedure and practice, third edition. Page 10, uh, 1060 prescribes uh, my role as chair of the committee in entertaining question of privilege. I'm gonna quote right from the book. The chair of a committee does not have the power to rule on questions of privilege. Only the speaker has that power. If a member wishes to raise a question of privilege during a committee meeting, or an incident arises in connection with the committee's proceedings that may constitute a breach, a breach of privilege, the committee chair allows the member to explain the situation, which I will do in a moment. The chair then determines whether the question raised, in fact, re relates to parliamentary privilege. At the and Dak, uh, so they're, they're basically going to, you know, wait for to, to, to talk about the NDP motion at the next OGO meeting, which isn't going to happen until the week of the 29th, so they're going to have to wait two weeks. The campaign of retaliation and intimidation against the two individuals who have appeared as witnesses on our, at our committee, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano, in connection with the evidence they've given to committee. Boston Gang Nong, page 115, explain that, and I'm quoting from them, just says, prima facie cases of privilege have been found for the intimidation of members and their staff. The intimidation of a committee witness has also been found to be a prima facie breach of privilege. And to quote, I'm satisfied that Mr. Generous has raised a matter which relates to parl sorry, parliamentary privilege. And accordingly, I invite, I invite him to move the motion and speak on it. But before I do, I will uh, suggest that we dismiss our witnesses, Ms. O'Gorman and Mr. Osowski, so that we can attend to this privilege issue. Witnesses, thank you for joining us again. Mr. Johns, I'll get you your, I will allow Mr. Genovese to address this, and then I will get your point of order. Someone's saying don't stop the video again or you will miss thank you, it. Thank you, Chair, and, and um, it's from dirt just out of respect for the discussion that was going on previously, I, um, I, I hope we can, we can deal with this issue quickly, but it is a very serious one. Um, so I would, uh, I hope we can get some consensus. I would, I would simply uh, propose that we ask the Chair to prepare a report which lays out the simple facts of the case and report it to the House. Thanks. I'll take a speaking list. I have Mr. Sousa, but we'll get to Mr. John's your point of order first. Well, my point of order, Mr. Chair, is that the SIPA loan extension deadline ends today. The, the member talked about urgency, but he's not talking about small businesses and the urgency they have. They're sweating it out. I had a, a constituent of mine call me crying yesterday about the, the deadline and the impact it's having on his mental, and why did you financial, wait so far, so long physical, to raise it? Then you support relationships, the there you go. health. It's, it's a matter of urgency. And, uh, and I know the Conservatives do not support small business. Right. Mr. Johns, I'm, uh, Mr. Johns, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I understand what you're saying. We will hopefully get back to the motion immediately if we can uh, dispose of the point of privilege, but unfortunately, for this case, under our rules, the, uh, the point of privilege and the issue around the intimidation of the witness has to take precedence. But the rules do state as soon as we can deal with this, and it's a very simple motion from Mr. Genos, we will return immediately 
hopefully today, because we do have resource continue for a bit longer, on uh, Mr. Souza's amendment to your very important motion. And I do take note of, <laughs> of the, the date of January 18th. Uh, Mr. Souza? He does it in a way you can't get upset. On with the it. privilege uh, motion? So we, we had the, um, the <laughs> Ms. O'Gormick come forward requesting an in-camera opportunity to discuss these matters a bit more open. And now we have a situation where we've just sent her away. <clears throat> and it's interesting that we want privilege when, in fact, it was broken, when she was prepared, prepared to appear to discuss this matter. I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned now that we are, in fact, manipulating and prejudicing uh, the, the integrity of the investigation. And I think it's, um, it's unfortunate that these procedures are taking place. We have motions before the House. Um, the, the fact that something is taking precedent over the others is a bit confusing, I think, for all that are watching and trying to understand because some of the urgencies that's being brought forward. I need clarity as to what is taking place here, why we let go of someone who is uh, appearing before us at the request of the committee, and we didn't finish off that um, uh, discussion, why we're now putting forward something that may provide uh, uh, to maybe very well hurt the integrity of the investigation and jeopardizes the procedure and why we're not giving Mr. Johns the respect he's requesting in respect to uh, his amendment that he put forward prior uh, to Mr. Genuous and the amendments that I put forward as well. Do you see how nervous Sousa is? He looks red as a tomato too. Like, look, he looks as red as our logo. He is nervous. He's rattled here, man. He is very rattled. I haven't seen him like this. He's moving all over the place. He's like getting up. He's shifting around. He is yeah, he... very rattled by this. So. What's going on? So the end game. So Genuus must have known that Johns was going to present this motion. Must have known that. And... You think so? Yeah. Yeah. And... Because um, it's, it's pretty standard that they, they see the motions that the different people are going to be presenting at committee. Um, that's usually on the agenda. So... He would have known that. And this is probably pretty shocking that they have raised this question of privilege. And um, sent the witnesses away. So I'm wondering if Sousa is really wondering what what do the conservatives have here in terms of evidence on this? He seems extremely worried about this. Not even worried, but agitated. Yeah. Like very, very agitated. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop uh, thinking about this in, in terms of 4D chess and let's, uh, let's keep going. Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Johns. Go ahead, then, uh, Mr. Genuis. Well, I, I would say this, um, that we just spent an hour and 57 minutes asking questions of witnesses here today at this committee at an emergency meeting on a constituency week. OK, it's not like we're not giving this issue a priority. We are giving it a priority. We met yesterday, another day where meetings weren't scheduled, on a constituency week. I have 31 communities in my riding. I'm missing events all over my riding because this issue is an emergency. When I bring forward another emergency with the deadline of today that impacts 200,000 businesses across this country and the Conservatives want to play games, like that's exactly what's going on here. So I would move that we call a vote on the, on, on, on the motion of privilege. Uh, we can get to that after we finish our speaking list, Mr. Genuis. Um, 
just, just, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Johns, I, I, I agree with part of what you said. Let's, let's, uh, let's proceed to uh, complete this matter. And then we'll immediately return to, to your issue. I, I, I am required procedurally, if I believe there's a breach of privilege, to bring it forward immediately. I didn't make the rule that it takes precedent, but we, we will, you know, we'll, we'll complete this and then we'll go to the next. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's an important issue. I'm done. Let's, let's proceed to a vote if necessary or simply adopt it and move on. Back to you, Mr. Johns, or is your hand still up from before? No, I, I, I absolutely want to uh, come back to this because, Mr. Speaker, if he felt his privilege was being breached, why didn't he bring it up uh, before? Why did he have to wait till there was going to be a discussion and a vote on extending the SIBA loan and a call from uh, this committee on the government to, to do filibuster. such a thing with a deadline? Why did he have to wait until this motion uh, was brought forward? Why did you have to wait till the last day? Yeah, here's the thing. So, Johns, um, <laughs> you're saying, you're saying, well, you know, well, I, I'm missing my my writings, and I and this was the last day. So, so let me get this straight. You wouldn't have been able to bring this motion if there wasn't an arrive can meeting, right, buddy? Yeah, because Parliament isn't sitting this week, right? The committee's not normally sitting this week either. Right. This was an exception. Correct. It was an emergency meeting being brought. So you sitting there whining and, and, and complaining like a freaking cow in heat is like, it. I'm, I'm not buying it. You should have brought this in in September, in December. Well, but, you know what? Maybe you guys shouldn't be the liberals' lapdogs and this wouldn't happen in the first place. Yeah, you're just pissed off that your attempt to filibuster was literally squashed immediately. Because that's all this was. That's all this was. And again, today's the deadline. Like, a committee can't extend the deadline of the SIBA loan, you moron. But you know that. You 100% know that. So, don't even. Don't even try and say, oh, the conservatives aren't supportive for small businesses. Um... They they support them fine. Yeah, conservatives didn't want to shut everything down to begin with. You 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 don't want you know you don't want that deadline to happen. Well, I guess you know you've had fifty million opportunities to vote no confidence against this liberal government. Like, sorry, NDP, you guys have zero zero ground to to stand on when it comes to literally any piece of legislation that has gone on within this government. Because yeah, because you, have you guys have to vote to all. support it. Yeah, all of it. So, you know, don't be crying. And, and that, <laughs> to, those, uh, to those wondering, um, Genuous was being very professionally articulate when he was saying, you know, I don't make the rules. You know, it's, it's my uh, uh, you know, obligation to bring up a, a motion of privilege, you know, when, 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 it, when it comes. And um, so he wrong. was basically saying, you know, cry more professionally in, in parliamentary speak. He's saying, cry more, Johns. Like, you you made your play, I made mine, and sorry, shut you down. And he's trying to say, well, you know, we had these people here, uh, you know, you know, uh, we spent two hours, you know, questioning them. Yeah, and then you chose to open debate on the the, the frickin' SIBA loan. Well, and the thing is, I don't know if the government could have changed the SIBA loan without the NDP they, vote. Well, I don't, I don't know how that works. But, like well, they can't, they can't do anything at committee. Like it's not like they can call Parliament and have a vote. Yeah, but I'm saying the NDP may have voted with the Liberals to change the the SIBA loans, how they were structured. I don't know that. I have to look up. The point is, all of this should have happened in December, but you know, the today's today's the deadline. Yeah, and. and what are you going to do? As was brought up by by the conservatives before, one of the amendments by Sousa was, well, we're going to wait for, what was it, 120 days? I four months? So. You're going to wait four months. Literally, literally until the end <laughs> of, of parliamentary session but before before summer. So, yeah, nice try. Okay. Well, since we do not have any more on the speaker's list, we will go to vote. But before we do so, can I get you, Mr. Genuis, uh, just to reiterate uh, the motion? 
Um, yes, I, I, I will chair. I, I um, just out of respect for one, one colleague has uh, um, stepped out of the room maybe for brief, brief, I'm not, I'm not, anyways, um, I think, um, okay. Um, not, not one of ours, but uh, anyways. Oh, okay, so the motion I have is I, I move that we ask the chair to prepare a report uh, which lays out the simple facts of the case and report it to the House. We'll proceed to the vote. Go to Mr. Clerk. Yeah. Colleagues, do we need a recorded vote or are we fine just to agree and move on? Recorded vote, please. There we go. This is a trap vote by the Conservatives. One? No. Mr. Baines. No. Yeah, this is a trap vote. Mr. Jahari. Oppose. Mr. El Khoury. So now it's on Paul. record that the NDP and the Mr. Liberals Sousa. are voting against no. um, examining a question of privilege. Mr. Brock. Now that's not a good look. Yes. Mr. Genuis. Yes. Ms. Cousy. In favor. Madame Vignola. I didn't hear. Mr. Johns. No. It's four yeas. This is defeated. Okay. That is defeated. We are returning to Mr. Johns's motion with Mr. Sousa's uh, amendments. I think Mr. Johns, who see your hand, will start a speaking list. Uh, we have resources probably for about another 15 minutes. Chair, Chair uh, just say a point of order. Um, can, you, can you help advise me on the procedural aspect of this? So we, we've raised an issue of, of privilege. Um, the committee has defeated a privilege motion. Um, does that um, effectively kill consideration of the privilege issue, or does that open the door for an alternate privilege motion to be raised? Um, I'm a, a bit perplexed by this in that we, we do have an issue clearly where the privileges of members are under under uh, under threat and um, we would have easily moved on to the other item if, if we had been able to adopt a, a privilege motion of some sort. Um, but the, um, the defeat of it leaves me wondering if we have any remedy, alternative remedy available to us or if, uh, if that's simply inferred to be the will of the committee to, um, you know, the will of the... Uh, of the, the two parties who voted against it to essentially shut down this issue. There you go, trap vote. Uh, let's suspend for a few seconds. I will uh, confer with our clerk and I will advise. Okay, so Spawny420 with another $4.20. Thank you very much. Anyone, when is the non-confidence vote? So non-confidence votes can be technically be anytime. brought at any time, um, but the next uh, predictable uh, confidence vote is going to be budget in March. So they have to pass the uh, the yearly budget, and uh, and that happens in March. And all budget votes, all supply votes, uh, which is what um, what anything really related to to money is, that's a supply vote. Uh, they are automatically confidence votes. So if the Liberals put forward their budget for a vote in the House. And that is defeated. Not only is the budget defeated, the government falls. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think this is where we've been told they're going to go to green screen. Oh, thanks, guys. Oh, that horrible elevator music. Dan Cairns tells us, do not go anywhere all. In, ca in all caps. So something good has got to be coming. So trap vote is um, is something where you know you're going to lose the vote. But it just makes the other parties look bad for voting no. Right. So, so this was a trap vote basically saying, so the liberals and the NDP are against parliamentary privileged WTF. You know, it's, it's a political trap for them. Just as the... Um, 
uh, the, the Ukraine trade uh, free trade deal. That was a trap vote by the, uh, the by the liberals because the the conservatives had to vote against it. They had to vote against it because it contained the carbon tax. Otherwise, they would have been been exposed for hypocrisy on their position on the on the carbon tax. And so that allowed the, the liberals to turn on and say, oh, you don't support free trade with Ukraine and all this stuff. So that's a trap vote. Um, aware with a 2799 Super Chat. Happy belated birthday. And this is not your longest live. Wow. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not? <laughs> oh, here we go. Given it's treated like a regular motion that another question of privilege can be brought back, but it would have to be substantively different from the first one. So treated point of order to clarify on that the motion would have to be substantively different or the question of privilege would have to be treated similar to a motion okay so we have substantively the NDP liberal different. coalition killing the the privilege issue for for the time being uh, yes that would be correct um, do you have a point of order uh, Ms. Vanola or on speak or add to the speaking list for the debate on okay, I, I Mr. Have another, Seuss's amendment so another point of order chair when you On a point of order or addressing okay. Mr. Sousa's? It's just about having the amendment just pour avoir. It's just, I would just like to have a written copy of the amendment in French and in English so that I can read it, understand it, um, because I do better with reading. I'm a visual person. Or on Mr. Sousa's amendments. Yeah. I have a point of order. Mr. Johns, is it a point of order or is it to continue the debate on Mr. Seuss's well, I, amendment? I, I, I would it, like to. Um, can you just let I, me know I'd so like I can speak? Yes, I, I would like to speak to that, but I think we should suspend while Ms. Vignola gets a chance okay. to look at the motion. Let me. Okay, so it's not a point of order. Mr. Seuss, do you have it in uh, writing for both official languages you can forward to the clerk? I do, and yes, uh, we'll that's forward that's to you now. Oh, it's just coming out now, so why don't we move on to Mr. Genuis's, uh, you had a point of order, Mr. Genuis? It's okay, I'll, uh, I'll have you to the speaking list, please, but I, 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 had, okay. I had wanted to see the the, um, the amendment in writing, but I understand that's going to happen. We'll suspend for a couple seconds to get the amendment out in writing to everyone. The suspense and is building, And then we have uh, Mr. Johns speaking on the amendment, then Mr. Genuis, and then perhaps Mrs. Vignola. today. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I hope I'm not waiting until 1.06 in the morning to, to listen to about Siva. <laughs> We're not done yet, folks. We're not done yet. Amendments have been circulated. I've got a speaking list. I have Mr. Johns, then Mr. Genuis. Go ahead, Mr. Johns. Before we get to that, might as well get to uh, Paradoxy with a $20 Super Chat intermission funds. Thanks for hanging in on this. We can't support you asleep, but hopefully this helps. Oh, thank you so much, Yeah, Paradoxy. I'm going to be dying tomorrow, but it's going to be worth it. It you better are, be worth it. You are so sweet. <laughs> uh, Okay, here we I go. Think something big is coming. Well, first, I, I do have wanted the opportunity to, to respond to Mr. Genius about the fact that we're today at OCO, we have an emergency meeting studying an urgent matter. Like I said, we spent an hour and 57 minutes uh, discussing this matter. We met specifically because it's so urgent today and yesterday on constituency riding weeks. But this is an urgent matter for those 200,000 businesses that are facing this deadline today. This is an, This could cost you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, I know the Conservatives don't support SIBA. They should just come out and say it. Um, 
merchant fees. They, they fought hard. Uh, they, did, they did not stand up against uh, lowering merchant fees and, 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 and for lowering merchant fees for small business. They sat idle on that. They, they lowered corporate taxes when they were under their watch from 5%, but 5% for large corporations, but only 1% for small business. And I know this. I was a small business owner, and I ran a chamber of commerce. Um, but they should come clean on this. And I hope that uh, they will support this amendment and this motion, and we can support small business. So I'd like to move to call the vote on the amendment right now. Thanks. We cannot go to a vote while we still have a speaker's list. So we go to Mr. Genuis, then Mrs. Spignola. Thank you, Chair. This, this has been really disappointing, I have to say. I, I was very clear, I think, that – oh, sorry, I, I'll stand back here. Just, it's been, been, been away for, uh, for four weeks, and I've missed committees so much, and now I'm excited. But, uh, Chair, uh, we have um, – we had an opportunity today – to do two things at once, to recognize the important issues raised by my privilege motion and also to deal with Mr. John's motion. And uh, I put forward a privilege motion uh, because I believe that the privileges of members of parliament are now under threat. They are under threat because we have a situation in which people came before our committee. They provided frank and candid testimony in which they were critical of other public servants and indirectly of a minister. They did so in response to questions that were asked. They weren't particularly critical in their opening statements, as I recall, but they, but they gave frank answers in response to frank questions. Immediately after that, those individuals were subject to severe retaliation, the extremely rare situation of public servants suspended without pay. This is what happened to Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano. Uh, we're concerned about what this uh, does for them, but in particular, this raises significant questions about the integrity of our democratic processes. We have been trying to get to the bottom of what happened in the Arrive Can scandal. We have had people, public servants, and consultants repeatedly lying and accusing each other of lying before this committee. So creating an environment in which witnesses can appear and can speak the truth and be protected while they speak this tr the truth is going to be our only way of getting to the bottom of what happened. And as such, I raised a privileged question, which, according to the rules, which I did not make up, takes precedent over the motion that was on the floor. I intended to do that in my final round of questions, uh, but Mr. Johns moved a, uh, moved a motion beforehand. Um, and and to, to Mr. Johns' point, he, 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 he says that he wanted his, his motion on SEBA dealt with. Well, if, if we had gone to the vote and we had passed the motion relating to recognizing the abuse of privilege that took place, then we would have immediately returned to Mr. Johns' motion. And uh, I would have been, you know, certainly favorably disposed to wanting to, to work collaboratively on that. Mr. Johns chose to throw in his lot with the um, increasingly evidently corrupt Liberal government in choosing to bury that question of privilege. And Liberals and New Democrats voted together to kill that question of privilege, which means we will not be able to proceed at least on that particular question of privilege and, and address this issue moving forward. Now that's, that's gravely concerning to me, that we have Liberals and New Democrats trying to bury this issue of, of retaliation against public servants who speak out. And it suggests to me that Liberals and New Democrats don't want to get to the bottom of what happened with the Rive can. They don't, they don't want public servants to feel comfortable telling the truth. They instead want public servants to feel intimidated, to worry for their jobs, and therefore to come here and toe the party line. That's not what I want. What I want is public servants feeling that they can be frank and honest, and when they're frank and honest before a committee, they will be protected. Um, and, and it was clear to me today from the testimony we received, from the witnesses that were, were before us, Immediate, they could provide no explanation 
for why immediately after witnesses appeared before this committee, they received letters telling them that they were uh, the, un, under a, a cloud of investigation. Subsequently, they had support for their legal fees pulled, and then um, and 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 now they're on leave without pay. We have retaliation against public servants who come before committee and try to provide frank answers to clear questions. Uh, point, point of order. What Mr. what Chair. is the government trying to to hide uh, and bury on this? Sorry, let me interrupt. Sorry, Mr. Jones, go ahead. It's taking relevance here in terms of the SIBA loan deadline today that is running out for 200,000 small businesses. I, I, I have the floor, Mr. Chair. I have the, the floor. Relevance? Point of order. It's not Thanks. a point of order. So you finish up, Mr. Johns. It's not a point of order. I'm listening, Mr. Johns. Go ahead. We could have done no, both. Okay. Is it my turn to speak, or are we? Well, no. We could have done both. You it's not your turn to sorry, speak. Mr. It's a point Genos, of order, please. Because it's Mr. Genoas, please. Are you finished with the point of order, Mr. John? Sorry, there's a bit of yes. conflicting. Thanks. I think, I think you got. I appreciate. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your point of order. We always allow wide latitude for relevance. Mr. Genoas, continue. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, now, if if this was about a sincere attempt to address both issues, we could have addressed both issues. Right. I, I would have been happy to work with um, Mr. Johns to adopt um, an agreeable privilege motion and then, to, um, and then to work on a motion that addresses the very serious uh, issues that he's raised with respect to SEBA. Now, instead, we have before us this, um, this nonsense liberal amendment that is designed at inserting explicit political attacks into the text of a committee motion. Now, this is obviously ridiculous. Uh, liberals would uh, no doubt much rather be um, throwing nonsense attacks at, uh, at the Conservative leader than, than doing the hard work of governing the country or than uh, helping us get to the bottom of what happened in, in a RIVE scam. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Mr. Johns is, is playing into their hands here. Uh, I would prefer if we adopt the privilege motion and um, and uh, killed these P silly P amendments Mr. from Chair. Mr. Souza. Okay, let me interrupt, and then Mr. We can Mr. Chair. Let me interrupt, Mr. Genus. Point of order. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Johns. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, the Conservatives went for the throat with Mr. Utano and Mr. McDonald, and today they're saying they're here to protect Mr. Utano. This is debate. Mr. Mr. McDonald, What's your point of order, Mr. Johns? Debate. Well, I mean, he's talking about a uh, point of privilege, but like, like seriously, you can't make this stuff up. Anyways, that's my point of... Uh, yeah, that's not a point of order, but I appreciate your comments. <laughs> Continue, Mr. Genuis. Uh, 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 Chair, um, I, I will, uh, although it wasn't a point of order, I will respond to the, to the implication of what, um, what Mr. John said. Uh, conservatives on this committee are committed to getting to the truth and to establishing the conditions in which witnesses can come and deliver frank testimony, uh, in which hopefully they deliver honest testimony, in which they can be asked, yes, hard and tough questions. And I think conservatives have asked tough questions of every witness that's appeared before this committee. We've pressed Mr. McDonald on his uh, claims. We've we pressed Mr. Doan on his claims. We, we pressed Mr. Firth. Um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. He said something very important. Did y'all catch it? Very important. Now everybody's thinking. Did you catch what he said in, in you know, the last like 20 seconds? What he said was... Conservatives are committed to getting to the truth and creating the conditions that witnesses can come and tell the truth. That's very important. So... So you think this is a, a ploy? It is. It's horrible. It is. It is a horrible ploy. He's um, and and that that's his response, right? To to John saying, "Well, 
because John's is, John's is just as surprised as the rest of us, right? And that I don't understand. You were going for the throat of Utano and and McDonald, and now you're here protecting them. And he said the right thing, protecting them. So it seems like the conservatives are doing everything that they can to make other public servants feel safe in coming forward and ratting on their corrupt liberal ministers. That's what this says to me. Yeah, but again, you're making saints out of sinners. I don't disagree. I think the method is horrendous. Because, like, again, two days ago we were telling everybody, yes, finally these guys have been held to account. And now yesterday and today, the conservatives are saying, oh, well, these poor guys, they're victims. That's not a good message. I don't care what the outcome is. That's that's a really shitty message for the public that, oh, yeah, these guys weren't actually held to account. They're victims. That's a bad message. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not about being for or against one witness or another witness. We believe, though, that every witness should be protected in their ability to come before this committee, receive appropriate support in the process, and not be subject to retaliation after that. If, if, if a witness comes here under conditions where they worry about employment consequences for telling the truth, then we have a grave problem for the health of our democracy. And I think what Arrive Can reveals is that we do have a grave problem for the health of our democracy. We have liberals and new democrats working together prepared to prevent questions of privilege of parliamentarians from being considered and going forward yeah gord john's and, and, this, right and, and, the, and the idea that this was point. about getting to see but look by the time we were on the vote we That's were already exactly on the vote is. so whatever happened at the vote it was going to be done after that anyways and mr john still chose to vote against the privilege motion so he has to be held accountable for being part of this cover-up part of, of failing to support our motion uh, to, to actually allow this issue to be properly considered. And, and further to that, we have these, these amendments. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Souza was a finance minister in, uh, in Ontario at one time, and I would certainly be happy to discuss uh, the record of the, of the Wynn government when it came to uh, negative impacts on, on small business. And I wonder if some of my Ontario colleagues will have, will have things to add to that. But he, but he, has, he has put in this motion, uh, he, has, he has tried to make it partisan by adding uh, just obvious nonsense uh, political attack language. And uh, it's clear that the Liberals would rather be um, uh, purveying these kinds of attacks rather than allowing the committee to continue to do the important work it has been doing on Arrive Can and rather than working, uh, doing the necessary work towards, um, towards the achievement of a, uh, of, a, of a consensus around this issue. And you know, just, just to reiterate, in terms of the timelines on SIBA, so the extension of the SIBA loan deadline is a decision that would have to be taken by the government of Canada. The, the executive would have to take that decision. There is nothing this committee could do or exactly. by doing would prevent from the government making that decision one way or the other. So small businesses who are concerned about any aspect of the agenda of this government, including regarding the CBA extension, Should be need to know that it is the Liberal government and the, and the that liberals. is responsible for setting and maintaining this deadline. And it is a Liberal government supported through a coalition agreement with the NDP. So if Mr. Johns wants to be up on a high horse and saying we need things for small business, the Liberals are ignoring small business. Well, he needs to go talk to his leader and his House leader, and he needs to ask them why they continue to give the Liberals a blank check. Why the NDP are so terrified of facing voters that they will give Liberals a blank check. Because that's what this really comes down to. Mr. Johns can, can, can say all he wants about, about motions at committee. But it is a decision of the executive regarding granting the extension. 
And whether the executive will grant this extension or not depends only on the House insofar as the House decides whether or not it has confidence in the executive. Now, our position is clear as it relates to confidence. We do not have confidence in this government. We have voted non-confidence, I think more or less, at every opportunity we've had. We did it hundreds of times in the fall. And, um, and our position is clear. We do not have confidence in this government. We think Canada needs a new government. Uh, the NDP have a different position. The NDP have confidence in the government. And they repeatedly vote confidence in the government, in spite of their crocodile tears over the impacts of this government's policies on small businesses. So I would challenge the NDP, if they are serious about wanting to do something for small business, then join us in expressing non-confidence in the worst government small businesses have ever had to deal with. Again, anybody that is concerned about the impact of this government's policies on small business should join us in voting non-confidence in a government that has been worse for small business than any government in Canadian history. The NDP will not do that. Instead, to try to cover for their failures. Mr. General, I'm going to interrupt. Unfortunately, we are past our time and we are out of resources. I am adjourning. No, Mr. Speaker, uh, point of order. I'm sorry, we are adjourned. Sucks to be you. Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. What the hell was that? <laughs> That was a setup for the fall session. That's what that was. You mean the spring session? Sorry, the spring session. That, yeah, it's um, 1.30 a.m. for us, so... Uh. <laughs> that, that was um, that whole tirade by Genius at the end. That, that sounds like it was an attempt to take away a whole bunch of steam from Jagmeet Singh when he stands up and he says, we have no confidence in this government. That, that sounded so, like a very big political play there. Anybody who questions... Oh, there's not going to be an election until 2025. I don't think so. And that is just the most recent reason why. Like, there's there's all this posturing right here. And the problem is, is Gord Johns is not an adept person when it comes to political strategy at all. And he just literally played right into the conservatives' hands with that privilege motion. Uh, King Gilgamesh, uh, Your Majesty, thank you very much. Uh, with a $2 super chat, I love the carbon tax on your, or I cover the carbon tax on your coffee. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah, yes, yeah, you yes, absolutely thank do. Thank you. Um, but um, yeah, that was, um, that was interesting, folks. Um, and one last surprise for everybody that stuck it out. So a story dropped in the Globe and Mail. While we were recording. While we were uh, while we were live. Mm -hmm. IT staffing firm invited federal officials to virtual whiskey tasting off-site meetings records show. Head of, uh, head of a private IT staffing company, GC Strategies, invited key federal officials to an Arrive Can whiskey tasting to celebrate the app's one-year anniversary and also invited officials for off-site meetings at various breweries, restaurants around Ottawa, according to preliminary records. So uh, here's some of the other pieces of it. Um, documents show CA, uh, CG Strategies Managing Partner Christian first sent an email to the four CBSA officials in April 2021 for an arrive can whiskey tasting that would begin at 5 p.m. on the 21st, a Wednesday organized by the company uh, called Thirst, Re Thirst Responder Mobile Bar. Company website uh, says it holds online events such as cocktail courses. Document includes call logs. Uh, listing hundreds of calls from Mr. Utano and Mr. McDonald to Mr. Firth between October 2018 and December 2022. Uh, Will Kalchuk, a $10 super chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, NP. Have a coffee on me. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, coffees are getting to the point where it's uh, $10. So yeah. there you go. Um, and uh, CBSA uh, President uh, Aaron o uh, Ogerman uh, appeared Thursday before the committee. Uh, Butler did not work on a Rive Can, but the company's two co-founders worked on an unrelated chatbot uh, with Mr. Firth. And uh, here's, uh, here's some of the emails. 
So I'll, I'll zoom in here. Um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, Christian first to Utano. Christian first to uh, McDonald. Christian first to McDonald and Utano. Tom Murphy. Uh, so um, you know you're you're seeing all of this stuff, and these are all these are all uh, government email addresses, right? So. So that's your that's your prize for staying until the uh, till the end of the episode. So. so, real quick, final thoughts. Um, honestly, people, I'm still I'm very disappointed in the conservatives today. Yeah, yeah, that was gross. I'm very upset. I don't really care what the end goal is. That that's just it's wrong. Um, and uh, this was a big risk. I think this is going to cost them some uh, a bit of support in the polls. Um, I don't think it's worth it. I think it's horrendous what they've done uh, in terms of the implication, the implication to the Butler whistleblowers. And, and future whistleblowers, any whistleblowers, like actual real whistleblowers, not Cameron and McDonald. That's garbage. Like, I get it. McDonald is, mm, what would you say of his personality? Narcissistic, maybe? Narcissistic. You could see it in, in committee, in the committee. Like, he, he has a huge ego. And I think the conservatives are trying to feed into that ego to goad him into testifying. I don't care. Like, well, it, it's, it's awful. This is just gross. Well, and the, the, only other, the only other reason why I could think that they did this um, is that someone has told them, either directly or indirectly, that there are other people within the federal service that may be close to ministers that want to speak out but are terrified of losing their jobs. And so what they did is they concocted this as a public play, which lays, lays a whole bunch of protection. I think the other thing, and especially after that speech from Genius, I think that they are setting up for an election and they are trying to tie the liberals into this really fast before they call non-confidence. Because as soon as non-confidence is called, committee is adjourned. That's it. It stops. Yeah. So... Um... So I think there's potentially other public servants out there that want to testify that that uh, that don't because they they kept alluding to that, and that's the only reason um, that that I think that they took this flip. So I don't think they give a crap about McDonald. They don't give a crap about Utano, and everyone knows they were you know had them by the throat. So the only reason for this is to make a very public display for those other people that potentially want to come forward that are terrified of losing their jobs. Now, if they come forward and they lose their jobs, it, it is completely, completely relatable back to this committee meeting. And they could, they could point their finger directly at, uh, at, at the liberal government, jump up and down about parliamentary privilege. And then the whole thing blows up. So to me, I think that's the, that's, that was the play today. It, it, it had really nothing to do with Aaron O'Gorman and, and John Osowski. It, it had to do with putting a blanket of protection for the other potential people that are in the public service that they want to talk to and bring forward. Because remember, he said, we want to, we're here to create the conditions for, for people to be protected. Like, so like, I'm actually extremely confident that that was now the reason. I hate the implication that it sets for Butler. I think that's a big casualty. But that's, uh, that's what I think. So uh, thank you, everybody, for staying with us. Uh, Dan Cairns, thanks for staying uh, with us to the end. Junior Sewell, same thing. I just want to address this uh, one real quick from E. Kingston. It says, Fox, just consider that you should be a little careful before adamantly declaring them gross. We want people to tell the truth. Very true. I'm, I'm just, the process is gross because it sends the wrong message. Yeah, and I, and I don't like the message that it sends Butler because when they say, every time the conservatives said that they testified truthfully and forthrightly, directly means that they believe McDonald when he says that Butler was only out to screw the government. And that is factually incorrect. Like, they have the evidence to, to refute that. So, um, but it was a political play. And, you know, I think... Because of this, I, I don't know if I'll be an MP because I don't I, I couldn't toe that line. I don't think well, I could. Well, and that's it. You've got to do things that 
maybe it works out in the end, maybe it doesn't, but you're going to hurt people along the way. I, I know I'm not cut out for politics because my personality is not like that. But. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was, I don't know if it was fun, but it was interesting. It was something. <laughs> um, it was definitely something. It's great to be on these live streams with all of you exposing this. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So thank you, everybody who contributed. Thank you, everybody who liked. And thank you, everybody who shared. Have a wonderful night. Get some sleep. And tomorrow night, we will be dropping our, our video about the Jamaica um, scandal on Trudeau's latest vacation. And Sunday nights, our regular live stream starts at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And uh, unless something pressing pops up, we're going to be doing a Q&A. So come on out and ask us some questions. So take care, have fun, and have a good night, everybody. Good night.